Jenny's ready. I'm ready. Aren't you ready?
Hello, welcome to the inaugural Zwift Games. I'm Jez Cox. And I'm Matt Stevens. And for the next two and a half hours, you're going to be treated to the biggest festival of cycling ever held on Zwift. The Zwift Games are comprised of a series of community events that are going to be running throughout March that anyone can take part in. And then at the weekends, it's time for the Elite Championships as our top Zwifters take on exactly the same courses as the community. And you can also join us in the studio and watch all the fun. Yeah, and for the first time ever for a championships, we had an open entry process. That means that any top level Zwifter could actually enter. Now, as a result, this is the widest and the most stacked elite field that we have ever seen. Across the men's and women's races, over 300, yes, 300 athletes from 33 nations will be going head to head over the next three weeks. And there uh, will we'll truly determine who will be the best Swifters in the world. Matt, it's gonna be so good. Right, let's get into what's actually coming up over the next three weeks of competition. So, first of all, it's the Sprint Championships. This weekend, the men on the Saturday, the women on the Sunday, which is the same at all three weekends. The first race is Loop de Loop, brand new course uh, in Watopia. Two laps of that, a little double loop to the bottom and a double loop to the right too. Yeah, the second race in the Sprint Championships, another unique course. It's familiar roads, but never been raced before the Jurassic Coast. Unusual, it's a place to place, 19.5 Ks, and the first 30 um, of the qualified from the previous race will race that one. Finally, appropriately, going on to the course that was used for last year's UCI Esports World Championships, the Glasgow Crit Circuit. Five laps, it sounds long, but it's not. It's only just over 15 kilometers, very short. And all three races, Matt, getting shorter and shorter. Indeed, we're looking ahead to next week, um, the epic championships. This is very epic indeed. Look at that, one big lap, 81.5 Ks, with just under 900 meters of elevation. And then the final week to finish things off, we're gonna batter the riders with one big ascent of the Alpe du Zwift. It's the road to sky course, point to point again, and all those zigzaggy bends to take them to the top. A fitting way to crown our Wahoo overall championships of the inaugural winner. These are the, uh, the prizes for the individual championship winners, starting with tonight's sprint races. $7,000 in bad, real money, not virtual money, real money and a Gold Concept Z1 bike, second $5,000 and third place $3,000. And then we have the Wahoo overall championships as well. Look at that, Jez, $10,000. And this is, this is, I repeat, this is real money, folks. This is not virtual money, this is real money they'll have in their wallets uh, come the end of these three weeks of competition. That's why, partly why, we have the very best field assembled. They all want some of that money and they all want some of this. Look at this gold kicker bike, Matt. It is absolutely beautiful. It's the most solid machine you can be Zwifting on anyway, but to have that gold livery is something really, really special. Definitely, there's only two of those in the world. One, of course, for the men and one for the women. Very special. Wow, I want one of them. But so unfortunately, I'm definitely not. Well, let's explain how it works because based on the placings from the sprint championships, racers will get points from 100 to one. First to 100th place towards the Wahoo overall championship. And so to help you keep track of who's currently at the top of this leaderboard, there's gonna be a golden leader's jersey nice. worn during races two and three. So keep an eye out. Yeah, look, that. a leader's jersey. Can't wait to see what that looks like. Mm -hmm. And now next weekend, as we've alluded to, we move on to the epic championships. And as you've already seen, it is a beast. You'll definitely want to tune into this one with the men's at 6 p.m. UTC next Saturday and the women's following on on the same time on the Sunday. Now the rods will take on another new course and it's gonna be around two hours of epic racing, a real endurance feat. The top 100 will again earn points for the Wahoo overall championships. And that final weekend is gonna be such a fitting climax with the climb up the Alp de Zwift to crown the Zwift champions climbers, as well as finding out who's gonna emerge as the winners of the Wahoo overall championships. Yep, we'll be in the studio following all of those different battles playing out on the upper slopes as they climb to the final finish line of the tournament. Now don't forget, you can check out all the information about all the Zwift Games Elite Championships using the, uh, the link which we're gonna share on the screen with you, zwiftgames.link slash raceguide. It's also in the notes underneath this where you're watching it too. Well, that's explaining how the whole thing works as a whole. Um, <laughs> 
Tonight's the really complicated night for all the riders, and maybe for you guys watching as well at home, because we have three races in one, but we need to remember, it's a very brutal elimination process as well, isn't it? After this first race, there's only gonna be 30 riders left. After the second race, there's only gonna be 10 left. There's an awful lot of people that are gonna go home. Empty-handed. Empty-handed. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, um, well, the 10 in the final round, so it's gonna be, yeah, tactically very nuanced, a little bit like the World Championships. So if you're familiar with the World Championships from last year, yep. this is what this uh, first round is gonna be like. Yeah. Now, we've seen what the overall championship's about. Let's have a little bit closer look at the sprint championships this evening, and look at the, particularly that first race in a bit more detail. So, as I mentioned, it's in Watopia. It's a brand new course, Loop de Loop it's called, and it, uh, it kind of starts fairly gradually. It's not too tricky. Slightly up and down around that bottom loop there as they make their way around the uh, JWB Sprint Reverse course, which lots of you will know, but that's the really tricky part. That uh, Swift, uh, sorry, the Zwift King of the Mountains there to the right-hand side before they take in the bottom loop. They do it twice. They pick up a draft power up each time through the uh, start finish line as well. And it'll be really interesting to see where they're deployed, Matt, as well. Yeah, the riders would never race this before, but they have had a chance to recon it. But it's that finish for me that's going to be uh, really interesting. Mm. Super, super fast finish coming pretty shortly after this with KOM, of course, which we take twice. So a really creative course over familiar roads, but a completely brand new configuration. Yeah, and only that one power up to be shared between all of them as well. That will be really interesting to see how they deploy that or watch. Definitely. Well, do they save it for the, the descent? Or, depending on where you are in the race, are you going to use it to try and get back on, having been dropped? Yeah. Right, well, the field is absolutely stacked with talent too. Zwift Grand Prix winners, national champions, top 10 finishers at world championships, continental qualifier winners, Olympic esports winners, and let's not forget the current world champion. It was very hard narrowing it down to just five, but let's have a look at the riders that we think will be the ones to watch for this particular race. Matt, we're going to start with the obvious one, the world champion. There is Bjorn Andresen in that world champion's jersey. He won it on the streets of Glasgow, which is kind of appropriate because we finished there this evening. I don't think he'll be getting away by himself quite as easily as he did in that World Championships one year ago. Uh, definitely not. Uh, Holden Cormier, the next one, the American, um, wearing big number 31. Uh, as you can see, he's wearing a vest. Whether that will be uh, in real life, in game as well, is, remains to be seen. Um, what's your riding style? He says, get this, he's efficient, fair enough, patient, I get it, vicious. But looking at those stats, that is no surprise. 15 seconds at just under 17 watts a kilo. That is very vicious. Actually, you know, Matt, one of the first things that our, our uh, sort of regular Zwifters, the community riders, will be looking at straight away are those numbers. And actually, when you look across them, there isn't that much difference between these elite Zwifters either. It's no, so close, well which, is, which is what makes for a great race. Onwards to Brian Duffy. Now, we're going to hear from Brian Duffy Jr. in just a little bit, actually, because we've got um, a bit of a chat with him as well, which will be insightful. He is, of course, the American national champion. And... Um, <laughs> He, interestingly enough, he describes himself as well as a poncher, a rider who likes to kick hard and attack a lot. So we'll be looking out for this, this evening. He does have a few teammates in there as well from his next eSports team as well. And we'll maybe come on to that dynamic a bit later. It's an individual race, but some of them are in teams. Indeed. Um, also, we've, I've got something in common with Brian Duffy. One of my favourite race courses is the Royal Pump Remate in Yorkshire. Or the yeah. not race, I just ride yeah. around at my own speed. Anyway, moving on quickly to Mr. Freddie Ovette, who looks in this picture to be in fine fettle, isn't he? Somewhat. He's in good yeah. form. And he has been training down in Denia in Spain with none other than Mathieu van der Poel, who of course has raced on Zwift as well. Um, his riding style, versatile, aggressive and naive. Well, let's hope for his sake he's not naive tonight. And apparently, <laughs> who will play him in a movie? <laughs> David Goggins. Do you know who David Goggins is? Is he an Australian actor? Yeah. It, well, I tell you what, I love a naive racer. It's right out of my rule book of racing. Finally, Jasper Paradines, the Belgian rider. This lineup would not be complete without a Belgian rider, of course, as well. And interestingly enough, Paradines describes his favourite Zwift race as being the points hunter. And that could be crucial for this evening in particular, where the canny awareness of where the finish line is, where it's coming to you, and your positioning that group is going to be absolutely crucial. He also has, if I'm not mistaken, the highest 15 second power there, watts per kilogram, 17.9, which should come in handy in that final sprint. Right, well, we've seen the route and the riders from our perspective. Now let's actually hear from that man we've just seen him, the American champion, Brian Duffy Jr., because he had a chat with Dave Towell about his thoughts on the Zwift Games and specifically the upcoming sprint race today. Well, it's going to be a real pleasure to check in with one of the top Americans in the Zwift Games. Let's meet Brian Duffy Jr. 
How does Swift Games suit you? I love how it's three different formats, the sprint, the epic, uh, the mountain finish. Uh, the, the sprint, yeah, I am really looking forward to that one to kick things off. Where do you think you're going to be the strongest specifically in the three sprint days? The last one in Scotland is probably my favorite just because it has a little climb on each lap and I think it's just going to be a war of attrition out there. But I do like the fact that each of the races has some challenge to it. I can do well if the race is hard. Uh, so I think the courses provide opportunities to make the race hard uh, so that by the time we get to the finish, uh, my hope would be that uh, we're, we're sprinting on tired legs. The next thing becomes the gamble, the risk and the reward. How willing are you to risk to win a gold Tron bike? If you want to win a gold Tron bike and, and win the, the entire race, I think it's going to come down to who's making the right risk at the right time. So, Brian, what about the Wahoo overall championship? Are you shooting for it? I would love to be a contender overall. I think I have a decent shot at it. I've, my versatility is pretty good. I think I showed that at the USA Cycling Championships. I think early on, I was a little bit more on the sprinting side, but I think I've, I've rounded out. So I'm certainly going to give it my best in all three races and you know see how that shakes out. But um, would you know, love to be in contention. When you look at the community, and we're talking about C-level, D-level racers, what's your advice to them who are competing in our Swift games? There's a lot that can be given. I learned a lot by reconning the courses and then also by uh, essentially filming my races. Because at the end of the day, a lot of, um, a, a lot of it is craft and timing for how you win and positioning of your avatar, figuring out when to start accelerating, how to position yourself is really important. And you can only really do that through repetition. Don't be afraid to take a risk. You know, understand what your strengths are and figure out how to play to those strengths. But if there's a good moment, take a risk and fully commit to it. And you'd be surprised uh, what the results could be. Okay, Brian, are you ready to rock up and get some rapid fire questions here? Let's do it. Okay, I'm gonna start with favorite power up. The ghost. Tron bike lighting color. What do you got? So I used to be green to match the next uh, kit, but I'm now wearing the USA blue on my Tron. Favorite Zwift racing world? Yorkshire, love the punchy climbs. Break away early or bunch sprint late? Break away early, ideally with a ghost. They make a film about the first ever Zwift games. Which actor gets to play the role of Brian Duffy Jr. if you're the casting agent? I don't think about this one hard, but I'm going to go with Matthew McConaughey. I love that guy. <laughs> nice. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. We really appreciate you taking your time, and good luck in the Zwift games. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. All right, all right, all right. All right. All right. <laughs> we got that, didn't we? <laughs> Matthew <laughs> McConaughey, didn't that's a bold it. move, isn't I know, it? absolutely. Blimey. Thank who would you get to play if they move about your life? Don't even go there. They won't be. Okay, just leave it. They won't leave that. You can do it. Get involved in the comments. <laughs> yeah, let us know. Thanks, Dave, for that as well. Good to catch up with him as well. Now, throughout these Zwift games, we're going to have some very, very special guests with us to help dissect all the action. You'll be pleased to know it's not just us sat here either. Uh, joining us, Nathan Guerrero will be our rider and race specialist for all the men's races. And alongside him today for the men's sprint races, we've got Adam Thorpe, the DS for the Zwift Grand Prix team, Wahoo Lecol. Now, both these guys know the field inside out, so there's no better combo to help us get the inside track on this race. Over to you guys. Hey, chaps. Hey, thanks a lot, Jez. Well, here we go with some great analysis. I've got one of the best DSs out there, the Wahoo Lecole DS, which is Adam Thorpe with an all new course look up, look at up front, loop the loop stage one. Adam, these racers have seen these roads a lot. I mean, it's hilly KOM forward. It's the SEs, but they've never seen them like this before. And we were talking a little bit in pre-production about what you think will be different about this. And so, Adam, what is going to be different about this stage one with Loop to Loop? Well, in particular, I think it's uh, it's this finish. We come super hot off that KOM. We're going to be descending in around probably 90k an hour and trying to position into that finish with about six, 700 meters to go. It's going to be really tough. Um, I think you can burn a lot of matches trying to get yourself in a good position, but it's going to be really key if we have maybe 100 guys still left at the finish. I mean, last time we saw a race like this was probably Continental Qualifiers a couple of years back, and uh, that was tough to get right. So, yeah, I'm interested to see what you think as well. Yeah, so Hilly KOM Forward used to be something that was used a lot. This is a mix-up of that with the loop, the loop, and they are, do have the SCs coming at them 
twice in two different directions and then the hilly kom forward twice and a lot of times a course like this uh, if it was just hilly kom forward they kind of wait for that but there's so much coming at them over and over again and you just talked about the new pack dynamics a little bit the idea of having to really fight for position at 80 kilometers per hour finding yourself maybe on the front maybe not in the right position and some of these riders maybe not trusting that they can get a top 30 with a full-on i don't know 500 meter sprint or something perhaps some riders are going to try and take advantage of what loop the loop offers when it comes to the SEs coming at you twice real quickly in succession then right up the, K the hilly kom and then right back into the SEs. i mean you've got some landscape to work with here we just heard Brian Duffy Jr. say, hey, are we going to risk it all to try and get that reward? So do you think some riders might be risking a lot earlier on to, so that they don't find themselves in that dice roll situation? I think they have to because um, a dice roll is probably exactly what this finish is. Um, it's, I, I don't think even the best sprinter in this field will be comfortable coming into this finish because of how much you're going to be out of control of exactly where your positions and with a big pack it's really hard to move through now as we say and if you're a climber or a real breakaway specialist i mean we've got some guys in here like hayden pucker you know he's he's got to want to do some damage before that climb and there's so many guys in here who really won't back themselves in a finish that they might just go fully at it have a go see what ha happens from it and that s is is the perfect place to really make a breakaway stick or use the momentum of the rollers to really you know leverage an advantage i think it'll be fascinating yeah and it's gonna be all about momentum and big power to the line be on the watch out for those trying to make the breaks happen because that may be their only chance and ramping up into that downhill 80 kilometers per hour on the downhill of the hilly kom that's going to be the most key spot i think out on course let's go back to the studio to get into the racing real soon gentlemen uh very revealing interesting good point about taking things in both directions as well of course yeah, totally now, quickly before the first race starts, for a little bit of gentle competition amongst all of the commentators for the Zwift Games. What do, mean, what do you mean gentle competition? This is serious stuff. It, you're right, it is serious stuff. I'm just trying to lighten it up, but this is serious. Okay, this is ser some serious competition between yeah. the Zwift, Zwift Games commentators. We've all made our predictions for the Wahoo overall. We're gonna track how these go each week, which I apologize for the person I've picked because he's never gonna win because no one wins when I pick them. But anyway, let us know what yours is in the chat. That's the crucial thing. Comment below, let us know who you think your pick is gonna be for the overall. Um, let's have a look at ours, shall we, Matt? Well, Jez, you've gone <laughs> for uh, Michel Plantereau, the Frenchman. What have, you, what yeah. have you gone for him? He is Mr. Consistent, or at least he was during the Zwift Grand Prix that we covered throughout the winter as well. Very consistent, rarely the big winner, but I think consistency might be what rewards the overall winner of this championship. It definitely is three weeks long um, mm. with, when you think about it, well, five different races. But yeah, he has, actually, he's been one of the riders that's really burst onto the scene this season, I yeah. think it's fair to say. Yeah. Um, Nathan has gone for Brian Duffy, who we've heard from. Um, he's going to be looking like Captain America on the course, I'd imagine for exactly the same reasons. All of these riders, actually, as we go through to the end, are consistent, and that's why we've picked them. But Brian Duffy, um, especially, imagine what it's going to be feeling like to be riding in the National Stripes in the first ever Zwift Games. Yeah. That's going to be give them another couple of percentage points, you'd imagine. Yeah, absolutely incredible. Um, you'll have noticed from the names, by the way, people watching at home above these pictures, we've got quite a few other experts joining us across the course of the weeks. One of them is John Mole, the Welshman, who's ridden in the Commonwealth Games for Wales, of course, in the past as a professional rider. Surprise, surprise, Matt, he has chosen not only a nipple photo, which is slightly confusing of Ed yeah. Morgan, but a Welsh a young Welshman as well for John Mould. Indeed, she's inside information there. Danny Rowe has gone for Ollie Jones, one of the OGs in Zwift Racing and a former Zwift Academy finalist. Um, I've gone for, unsurprisingly, Lionel Villasan. He's a real character, another big OG. And Hannah, who's she gone for? Yeah, well, she's gone for the world champion, Bjorn Anderson. And we've mentioned already he had that flying, almost race-long solo break to win those world championships. Yeah on the Glasgow circuit as well. So a big, big favorite today. Some fairly obvious picks from us. I like uh, I like a couple of necks being stuck out there with Ed Morgan maybe, and maybe even Ollie Jones, but we'll see, yes. won't we? Everything will be revealed. And of course, we'll be tracking those predictions throughout the whole 
of the uh, the whole championships. Pressure's on, pressure's on. Um, now, yes, we've got the ride on thing as well. Yes, we? we have. That's the last thing to mention to you at home before we get going, because you can take part in this, not just by riding as well on your bike and taking part in these stages, but also you can give your favorite riders a ride on to support the riders around you. Just open up your companion app, search for the rider that you want. We're gonna go in this instance with Teppo Lario, and he's level 100, so that definitely deserves a ride on. You can follow him, favourite him as well while you're there, and he also wanted us to pass on that his favourite dinosaur is a triceratops, a cuddly triceratops at that. Indeed. Um, the riders of the most ride-ons today will wear the ride-on jersey next week in the epic race, so uh, we'll be seeing that jersey next week. Uh, and remember, it's only for the first race as well, and there'll be a countdown on the left of the screen with five minutes to go, so it won't be all the way to the end of the race. Hopefully, you have 15 or 20 minutes in which to select your best riders, but it's only in the first race. Um, so yeah, make sure you get involved. It's all about getting involved. This is all about the community to get involved in the ride-ons and also get involved in the comments. I believe the race has started. The inaugural Zwift Grand Prix starts here. This is fantastic. So race one, round one, the first of three sprint races in this opening weekend of competition. Don't forget, this evening it's the men's racing and tomorrow it's the women's racing. Exactly the same format, same prize money, same everything. We've got around about 170 riders starting. Do not forget, at the end of these two laps, only 30 riders will go through to that uh, second race. The rest of them are all out. Look how quick this is, and look who's on the front. It is our world champion resplendent in those uh, beautiful rainbow bands. Um, they've got to really watch out for this one, don't you? You, 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 you'd, you'd imagine that the riders who don't favour their sprint, given the size of this field, I think there's going to be a, quite an aggressive race. Yeah. Um, and as we heard earlier on um, from Adam, the riders have had an opportunity to ride this course before. They'll know it, but they've never had a finish over the climb and down the descent. It's a completely mm. different, dyna different dynamic and a different approach. And I have a feeling that a few riders won't want to risk it, so it might go early on the climb. And maybe not lap one, but lap two. So I'm expecting a fast race already pretty quick already. Mm. Uh, could see Ollie Jones, another one of the uh, many OGs here. But look, we've got an early mover. Yes, this is interesting. This is Aaron Burrell just off the front, but he's knocking out seven watts per kilo. So he's not hanging around right at the beginning of the South African, wants to get himself noticed, wants to be out front. He's just gapping them ever so slightly as well. A little gap there. By the way, it's worth pointing out, particularly those of you who might be new to watching Zwift Racing here with us, all of the equipment is neutralized. Despite the fact that you can see riders wearing different helmets, different hats, different kit, different colored bikes, and all the rest of it, that is all neutralized to make it an entirely level playing field. All that we're testing here is the rider's physical capacities on their bikes. And the, the, this is the, one of the remarkable things, particularly about the Zwift Grand Prix. We have riders right now in that bunch all over planet Earth, all different times of day and night, all different conditions, different weather conditions, wherever they are. And uh, here they are in one pack together. I suspect, Matt, for uh, one of the last few times. Lovely to see ride-ons hammering, raining down on them as we look at them. It's too. a blizzard. It's either a hailstorm, it's either rain, or it's a blizzard of ride-ons. Thanks very much for getting involved. And for the first time ever as well, as you can see on the right-hand side, you've got the positions of the riders, you've got their, their power output, their watts per kilo, and then the little thumbs up. There's a couple of riders that haven't actually got any ride-ons yet. Mr. Mark Santo, who's leading, he needs one as well. So please do get involved. You can recognize the riders that are by their bibs. And one thing that I do think we need to touch on up in the early stages, and maybe we should uh, throw to Adam and Nathan, is to talk about the team aspect, because there's multiple riders here uh, who ride in the same teams. Some riders have got their team jerseys, some are riding in their national jerseys. Uh, let's throw over to Nathan and Adam to discuss that, because guys, this is so different, isn't it, in terms of um, team tactics and how riders are going to race this compared to what we saw in the Zwift Grand Prix. Yeah, it's a great point, Matt. And I think the reality of what we just saw from BL13 there from Aaron Boreal is exactly what you're talking about. There is still some team tactics here. You know, from a DS perspective, Adam, you, if you've got some matches to burn and you know only a 30 are getting through and you've got teammates that have made it here, you're going to put some risk on the line. And it looked to me like Aaron Boreal from BL13 a team that's really no well known for getting wins from tactics specifically. We're just trying to make the pace really high and faster, maybe to burn out a little bit of the other riders. But that plan only at 5.7 watts per kilogram might be, need a little bit more than that. Hey, Matt, hey uh, Adam. 
Yeah, I think so. Um, I don't know. They they always have something up their sleeve, BL13. So it'll be really good to see what that plan develops into as this race goes on. But, you know, it could have just been that he was kind of getting himself off the front just a little bit to try and encourage other attacks to go over the top and create some kind of chaos within the race. Um, you know, nothing happens if everyone sits in the bunch. You kind of need this move that we're seeing right now from uh, Kiko Ariel. Like, you need something like this to sort of make someone want to attack across to you, make something happen. And uh, that's exactly what we're seeing right now. And he's really pushing on. Ariel, yeah, this is a big, this is interesting because this is not a rider that we're extremely familiar with, actually. So, you know, that's another thing to bring in here. You've got these teams that are all really familiar with each other, but to play off a little bit what Matt was saying there, also, there's unknowns that might be able to sneak away where you might have a rider that's like, well, we don't know who that is. Let him go. That's going to be brought back in. And I think there may be a lot of patience in this crew at this point because the Hilly KOM most likely will bring a lot of stuff back, wouldn't you think, Adam? Yeah, I think that's exactly what we're seeing. They're not too worried, I think, about one rider going. But I think as soon as we see five, six, that's where people start to get just a little bit nervous and they sort of maybe ask their teammates to try and bring something back. They've probably all spoken in advance within their teams like Next and Coalition and Wahoo Lacole. They almost certainly would have spoken about who really believes they can get through this first round and what scenario will favour them or all of them to get through potentially. So they'll definitely have spoken about this. They will be working together, but this is an individual competition and everyone's going to have their own sights set on the finish line and a good position for the overall championship as well. Well, they're going to be hitting the SEs in just a moment. Back to Jez and Matt. Thank you, guys. Right, we've now got, well, we did have briefly a two-rider leading group. It's been the Spaniard, Kiko Ariel, who's been in the lead, knocking out some pretty big watch to stay there, too. We've seen him in shot as well, out of the saddle, working hard. He has been joined by Tom Breyer, the Belgian rider. Now we have two riders in the lead. We can see that gap is bridgeable because Breyer's just done that in very, very quick fashion. I wonder if others might be tempted to join these two. We might have the formation of a leading group. Definitely Breyer is happy to lay it on, Matt. That's a good move as well. And as Nathan was just alluding to, there's going to be, because of the size of the field here, it's got around 160, 170 riders that have signed on. So it's an enormous field. Um, so the, plaque, the, the pack dynamic, shall I say, are going to play a big part. But because of the size of the field, we are going to see some unfamiliar riders. So there will be a lot of your Zwift OGs, the riders that we're familiar with year in, year out in the Zwift Grand Prix. And there will be some other riders that are going to mix it up and, and both Tom Breyer well Kiko Ariel in, in particular a rider we don't know too much about and one rider we do know a lot about my favourite for the overall is Lionel <laughs> Viasan who's just moving up uh, just making sure this group doesn't get too far ahead but um Remember, this is a scratch race. There's no points on offer at all out on the course. It is the first to cross the line. The first 30 will count, but a lot of these riders will not trust their sprint. So they're going to want to try and do something a little bit different. And as you said, it's really important you talked about the standardization. There's also a standardization. I think there's, there's three, different, three, three different brands of, of, uh, of home trainer that riders are using as well. And every single rider in the Zwift Games for every single race has to have a video feed as well. Yep. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of governance in place um, to make sure that this is run off as smoothly and as fairly as possible. So, uh, yeah, a lot of constituent parts to bring these games together. And I'm loving this new graphics interface as well. So much information yep. for us to grab yep. from. And hopefully you at home are enjoying seeing the race numbers on the back of the riders as well, which is quite a rare thing in Zwift racing. You can see at the bottom, scrolling through with all the riders taking part. It is a massive bunch as well. So understanding and reading those bunch dynamics is a key thing, isn't it, for any elite Zwifter, Matt? But we've got three different bunches today, one with 170 riders in, then we're going to go down to 30, and then we go down to 10. And I must admit, difference. I'm still quite new to Zwift racing myself and finding my way around it, and I still don't know what, what's worse, because you can be in the middle of a big pack of 170 like that, and suddenly you're at the back. The same can happen in a group of 10, but at least you... At least when you're in a group of 10, you always know the back is always very near. Whereas yeah. in here, you can get lost in there, can't you? You can, especially when things start to get stretched out. And it was interesting um, when we heard from Adam earlier on about these pack dynamics, about how tricky the sprint is going to be. They're going to be riding in, in that finale at about 60, 70, maybe even 80 kilometers an hour. So there's an opportunity to get into a super tuck. But it's how they um, carry that momentum through to the finish is going to be interesting. Because although these riders... Are, Although these riders 
actually know this course, they won't have raced mm. the finish like they're going to do. So uh, that's going to be the interesting thing for me. Now, Matt and I are privy to lots of information. You can be privy to just as much information if you use the race dashboard. There's the link at the bottom of the screen for you as well. And you can see exactly the data that we're seeing as well off to the right hand side. It's a really useful way of watching. If you can double screen it while you're, uh, maybe if you've got a phone or a tablet alongside you while you're watching this, I know many of you will have, you can pick up all of that data as it's being fed to you as well and maybe even anticipate an attack happening as they're coming from behind as we so often see in Zwift racing, getting the slingshot. This There's is, the link. Yeah, it's the most interactive we've ever got on this. It's another layer, and hopefully that will make you feel far more involved in, in, uh, in it. And, and of course, you can actually ride on these courses as well. We'll give you some more information at the, the back end of the show and how you can get involved. Because uh, I wonder if anybody's actually riding the course now and actually watching. Are, are any yeah. of you on Zwift get involved in the comments while you're watching this? Or have you ridden on Zwift earlier? Yep. Or are you going to be inspired to ride? Yeah. There we go. We're through, uh, back through the finish. That's the first part of the loop done. And it means they've picked up the first of our power-ups, the draft power-up, which gives them an increased draft from the rider in front, obviously, for 40 seconds. By the looks of it, Matt, um, well, hang on, that indicating, we're not, are we dropping them now? Riders in there trying to just hang in there by the looks of it and uh, using them early. I mean, they've not got long to use these draft power-ups either because now around. they've gone back through the finish line, they're heading now over the, uh, the Zwift K KOM, the King of the Mountains point, the only proper climb on this course. Um, there's got to be riders sitting in there and waiting for that climb so far. And in a way, I can't help but think, Matt, I, I would quite like to see the Sprint Championship won by someone who's been 30th in this, and <laughs> 30th in this, and then 10th in the next one, and then they win the third race. Well, that's the, that's the thing. Although this is called the Sprint Championships, in total, approximately, they're going to be riding over the next three races or the two races after this, including this one, for about an hour and a quarter. So they've really got to watch how they use their energy. So the, the best way to get through this race is to be 30th. That's the most efficient. Yep. And also spend the least amount of energy. Yep. And riders are going to have to do that in a different way. And then in the next race, when there's only 30, to save strength for the, the last one, it's all about efficiency. It's all about who can uh, race in, in a canny way. It's about good legs, but it's not just about showing how good you are. It's how smart you are. As we hit the climb for the very first time, this is Brian Duffy Jr. out of the saddle. He does look like Captain America, a proper Avenger, isn't he? What can you do? How many <laughs> watts in addition to the amazing amount of watts will that jersey give him um, as they head up this climb? I tell you what, should we throw to yes. our two experts again? Because what I want to learn about is the pack dynamics especially in a field this big. How's that going to affect the racing, Adam and Nathan? Yeah, it's a great point. And this is a little bit of an education point, maybe for those who haven't been around Zwift for a while, is that the pack dynamics now act a lot more like you got to put your elbows out. You got to fight for position. If you're just matching watts per kilogram to watts per kilogram amongst some riders there, a lot of times it's not going to let you buy. You have to give a little bit more than those riders. You have to fight for position. And so speed and momentum matter a lot and positioning matter a lot. Because if you do have more speed and momentum, the game is going to let you buy. But if you got just match for match when it comes to those watts per kilogram, you can find yourself at the back fighting pretty dang hard to try and move forward and not actually be mo moving forward very much because of that new pack dynamics. Adam, how has that affected things for your team at WLC and how do you see that playing out for this race? I definitely, as a DS, I really, really focus in on pack dynamics as much as I can. What we just saw from Brian Duffy Jr. was a really small thing, but it was really important in terms of how it really bosses, like riders are able to boss these pack dynamics. Like Brian, before the, the base of that climb was dead last and he made a little surge to increase his momentum before he went into that climb. So as they hit the base of it, you saw him shoot through, right through until the first wheel. And then for the next 10 seconds or so, he was doing two watts per kilo less than everyone else. It's really, really smart riding. And it's little things like that, which add up in a race like this, because you're looking to conserve so much energy. And, you know, if you're a climber, I mean, I don't even know how you would play this finish. Uh, it'd be good to get your, your feedback on that, Nathan. But with these pack dynamics, I think I'd be looking to try and get as far forward in the bunch as I could. 
Yeah, it's a good point. And that free speed and those free positions are 100% that I actually was looking for when I did this race in the community races just yesterday. That is so absolutely key. And as also a coach at a DS, that is something I teach the riders often is to use that momentum in the climbs to find yourself in the free position so you don't have to be fighting because the reality is is the amount of watts per kilogram that you have to put out the amount of power you have to expend to get by riders compared to two watts per kilogram for three seconds versus having to put out two or three more watts per kilogram than everybody else around you we're talking 600 watts for a little bit massive matches so that is a huge one when it comes to the new pack dynamics. They are going to be using those pack dynamics downhill in just a moment. We saw a couple of attacks just a second ago, so we should probably get back over to Jezimac to get us into this action because I think it's about to heat up heading back down into the Essies. Thanks, guys. Well, in when we, when we next go back to Nathan, I'm going to find out how he did in yesterday's race. That's the main thing. He raised <laughs> that he did it. We've got to find out how he did. Right. A shuffling at the front and some big riders coming through. Kel Power, the Belgian, rolling through to the front. And as Nathan pointed out, some of the very best Swifters choosing to move quickly through as well. Bjorn Andresen right at the back there. Andy Nichols as well for the BL13 team in the orange and yellow. Right at the back wearing that lovely flat cap. We've got one rider now. Lennart Yash, who's just gone off the front. Got a little gap. We're into the descent now, Matt, too. Yeah, it just, uh, this is this right hand. And normally on this descent, we'd actually go left and straight down. So this is this new part of the loop. You can obviously choose when you're just riding on Zwift normally to turn right here, but this is very rarely used in any sort of racing. And this is unique in this particular brand new configuration, the loop to loop. I do hope we use it in the future for future Zwift Grand Prix. So this is the first time, but just look at the speed now that these rods are gonna be doing. 62 Ks an hour. And this isn't the finish, remember, this is, the, this is just going back down through. So Andreasen here, a lot of these riders will be using this opportunity for one of these little micro breaks, getting into the super tuck. We're well over the speed that you need to be going at. As you can see, Bjorn Andreasen there, he's only uh, took, uh, putting out 238 watts, just rolling through. But we've got an attack off the front. Mm. Two riders just gone clear, Leclerc of Canada and Ruben Dant, another one of the Belgians in this field, a rider I'm not overly familiar with, but that I think is going to be the theme. And then the ever-present and the ever-popular. Look at the amount of ride-ons for Teppo Lorio. 61, the most amount of ride-ons I can see so far. But he's always at or near the head yeah, of affairs, isn't yeah, we've he? We've kind of teased that one. because That's my fault. I take full responsibility <laughs> for that. But this is not too much of a surprise, really, Matt, when we see slightly, no disrespect, but slightly lesser-known riders trying their hand now. They're in such a great pack. It is, it is you know, an incredible world-class field of Zwifters right here. So if, you're, if you're feeling on the back foot, you're not sure of your chances of getting to that 30, why not take a chance and see if you can form some kind of leading group? Exactly. It's all about momentum. That little explanation earlier on from Adam about um, this, the way that you apply the power at certain bits of the road, how you can use a momentum in game. Um, but again, there's no real way of doing it in a pack like this. There we go, through the finish again, 12.4 laps to go. We're back on to lap number two. I really quite like this figure of eight. It's really yeah. quite interesting, yeah. isn't it? Especially turning right over the top. But it's not in the Swede who is now moving clear. Um, make sure that you do get involved in the riders. Remember, there is the cutoff. You've got under five minutes to fire open your uh, uh, Zwift companion app and get involved, as well as getting involved in the comments. You've now got four and three quarter <laughs> minutes to get some ride-ons. I think it might be Teppo Laurier who's leading. Brian Duffy Jr. there with 46 ride-ons. Let's see if we can get into triple digits yes, for these riders. Yes. Please do get involved. Smash that ride-on button. So, Johan Noren of the Swedish Zwifters just getting overlapped now. That was a big hit out by him down onto the flat, coming back along the edge of the beach now. They've all just picked up as well, don't forget, the next of their draft power-ups as well. Most of them hanging on to that. We, it was interesting, Matt, watching when they were using them. And it, you noted to me, just in my ear, that quite a few of the riders were using them just to recover, to get back into that totally. pack and recover on the wheel. Yeah, some riders, because that, the climb is so fast, um, you can, especially the second part of the climb, you still get the benefit of the drafts. So some riders were using it there, but lots of riders were using it as a little bit of a rest just so they can ease off the gas, get a bit of recovery before the bottom part of the climb. And the first part of the climb is where it's at its steepest. So riders are using it in different ways, as we see Andreasen, our world champion, attacking here as we approach the S's. Let's watch his watts, because he's going downhill, don't forget, and he's touching nearly eight watts per kilo there. That's a pretty big effort downhill as well, isn't it? He's making it look easy though, isn't he? Look at he that. Is. It's almost like he's going down the, <laughs> riding down the shops to get a pint of milk. He makes it look that easy. And again, this particular section, the S's, 
really, no, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say hard to judge, but you really need to know when to apply the power. Let's have a look at the dashboard again. This is another opportunity for you at home to get involved. You can actually, if you copy that link, paste that into your browser, fire open another screen on your phone or on another laptop or, a, or an iPad or something similar, and you can really drill down. And if you click on one of these riders, you can actually personalize the right-hand side of the screen. Yeah. So you can select your five favorite riders that you want to get a, a bit of a look at, and you can really see the kind of effort that they're making, uh, how many watts they're doing, their heart rate. So all of that detail is there for you to mine, uh, for you to really fully understand what it takes to be involved at a Zwift race at the highest level. And if you love that data that much, you really ought to get out more. That's, that's uh, my personal, nah, well, I think, I'm just I think kidding. everybody's watching, we of always get out more, don't no, we? No, we do. We are, we're all techies, aren't we, yeah. really? Well, you've got to bear in mind, Matt, quite a few of the people racing right here are in lovely, warm countries anyway, where it's not quite as wet and cold as where we are. Right, all back together. Yes. Ruben Dont there with another big hit out. Uh, but you've got to recover from these things. And if you're hoping to be in the next of the two sprint races this evening, we really are talking triple recovery here. Every one exactly. of these attacks, even the likes being made by Bjorn Andresen, could take their toll by the time we get to those final 10 in Glasgow, the third and final race tonight. Indeed. Well, I'll tell you what, well, I've, I've got a question for Adam uh, and for Nathan. Uh, another question. What chaps do you think that the riders here that are looking to do well today could have learned from that first descent? So Adam, up first. Okay, they, they can train around it. There's nothing quite like riding in a pack this big. What do you think they would have learned on that first descent heading into the finish? I think the first thing they'll have been looking at is where they were at at the base in terms of position in the pack and where they were about 10 seconds later. I think hitting the speeds that they're doing 90k an hour feasibly on that descent if you're at the front when you hit that base you're going to hit the wind so hard and you're going to shoot really far back in the pack and i think everyone will have just made a judgment call based on what they saw because they're only going to see it once before it really matters so i think they would have seen where they were made a little bit of an understanding of that and probably adjust their race strategy for the this lap now based on that positioning but um yeah it's really really tough to call and i'm sure they've probably all just realized that as well and i think we may be seeing that as well by how many of these big names are now really trying to avoid the sprint finish so yeah very very interesting dynamics going on right now yeah, and that spot that you saw Johan Noren go, you were asking about my race yesterday. That's actually the exact spot where I made an attack and got a two-man breakaway. I ended up getting beat at the end by the Copatriot in the uh, breakaway. But as you can see, leading into the SEs, all the big hitters went immediately to the front. Then after all those attacks, people were really, really nervous. And now we're seeing Severo, the Italian Taking that roll through speed, roll through speed is really what it's all about. Momentum, speed is still king out on course, not just Watts. And you saw him come off of that sprint section and immediately get two or three seconds. And what's really interesting to me, no one responded. Everyone just sat there and watched. And now we've got a little bit of a situation where people are getting concerned perhaps. But I think the only thing that's going to happen from here is either the pack is going to naturally bring this back through the SEs or we're going to see monster attacks to come to try and bridge across. But between now and the climb, there's not a lot of time. So there may just be a trust that over the top of the climb, it's going to be so intense that they're going to bring Savannah back. Or look, it's one out of 30. Let that go. I'm going for 29. So... A lot of interesting things playing out on course. Not a lot of landscape left to work with. One time through the SEs and one time over the top of the hilly KOM. Back to you and Jez and Matt. Thank you, guys. Thank you for that. Wow. Oof. This is a big, big move we're watching, Matt. And this is going to take some recovering from because Nicolo Severa has now nearly 13 seconds. It's just continued to grow since he left as well. We saw the chase starting from Ruben Dant, who was leading the chase. But now they're starting to look at each other. They know it's the first 30 riders through. We could actually see this first sprint race being won by one lone leader because the gap is continuing to grow. Nearly 14 seconds now for Severa. This was a brilliant move. Yeah, it's a very smart move. And one thing we can discern from this move, Jez, or one can uh, like assume is that he doesn't fancy himself in the sprint, so he's gone early because he's committing a lot here. Hey, I mean, he's really punching. He's holding about six watts a kilo. Then up this little drag, he's lifting it again to eight watts a kilo. It's going to be hard to maintain. Uh, no more opportunities to get the ride-ons. That's done, but he's got a, a, obviously a popular figure, 34 ride-ons for, uh, ride for the Italian. 
and he's continuing to build that lead, but it's going to be very, very hard to maintain it even over the climb, especially the first part of the climb, because I'm expecting a lot of the punchier riders who don't fancy the chances in the sprint. And also, Jez, you could fancy your chances in a sprint, mm. but it's so nuanced from such yeah. a big pack that it's very easy to get wrong. So if you're a strong rider, just take no chances and try and split it, get in a group over the top of the climb. I would not want to be leaving it to a finish no. because this is the first ever time, again, apologies for appearing like we're repeating ourselves, but this finish in this way, completely unique. So unless you've done it before, there's definitely a little bit of the unknown in play here. Yeah, and and this is but this is a big, big move that if he has got it wrong and gets caught in the next couple of kilometers, Off. Severa is not going to recover no. from this because that's 15 seconds of lead now he's got. He's consistently a couple of watts per kilo going a couple of watts per kilo harder than the whole chase pack. This is all in or nothing. If he gets caught, he's going to be, well, he'd be doing incredibly well to even hold on and finish in the top 100 at this rate. But let's see. He's got another, he's got another uh, 0.1 of a second. He's now hovering at 15 seconds. It's kind of stayed around there, but he's into the climb now as well. Yeah, he certainly has some big names in there as well. Harvard Gledners, Kiel Power, Ollie Jones, uh, Morton Christensen, all in the mix. Names that you'd expect to be up there at this point in the race. As you can see, 24 minutes, approaching 25 minutes. We're probably going to be looking at around 34, 35 minutes of action before that 15-minute break approximately and round number, well, race number two, should I say. But Severa, well, this is impressive, still holding 5.3 watts a kilo and bearing in mind the elevation is dropping as he heads back towards the final ascent underneath the tunnel. This is the traditional finish, of course. Then we've got that last little bit of a loop that takes us back into the finish in the other direction. Well, this is fascinating stuff. 17 seconds, though, Jez. So he is not letting off at all. Okay. 350 watts, just under 6 watts a kilo. And the lead continues to grow. Uh, yeah, leading the chase is a countryman of his, of course, Ricardo uh, Panz, uh, Paniza as well. Now he's ruled back. We've got a bubbling front end to this peloton. They all know first 30 riders go through. This is all in for Nicolo Savera and he continues to lead. He's got nearly 20 seconds now, Matt. It's looking far more likely with just over five kilo, five and a half K to go on this second lap, the opening race on the loop de loop course that Nicola Severa is looking like he's going to win it he at just, this rate. It, it's, he's, got, he's got a good chance, but it, I, he could lose 15, 15, 20 seconds very, very easily on the climb. He just needs to back off a little bit and make sure he doesn't overcook it. The last thing you want to do hitting the steep bit at the bottom of the climb is hit that at six watts a kilo. You want to back off and then get over that steep part and TT it to the finish. Because what we've got behind as well, although he's now got a 22 second lead, it's looking more likely that he will stay away, is the sheer momentum of the peloton behind and how much they can pick up, how much faster they can go over the top of the climb and down the descent. As we pass through the finish, we bring in our experts one more yes. time to see what they think. Nathan, what do you think about uh, the effort here of Nicolo Severa? 25 seconds with just under 5Ks to go. It's still going to be hard, but he's in with a shout here, mate, isn't he? He's got a shot, really. If this wasn't pushing on to 30 seconds or so, I would say no way. The reality is, is that with the energy that he's put out, right, he can probably do somewhere around a 140 to a 150. If he does better than that, I'm going to be, like, blown away. The pack, look in the 120-ish. If they're going full gas, trying to win this race, and and trying to split things apart, we're talking 120s for the, for the KOM and Severa. Can he hold a 150 or so? I mean, that's getting caught, too. And plus, over the top, you still got a bunch of speed and chasing going on. It's going to get all kinds of crazy over the top. So it's going to be really interesting. Now, Adam, I know that you really want to talk about sprint tactics, though. So there's the climb coming up here. We come into a big bunch sprint or even not a big bunch sprint. There's still going to be battles for this sprint coming up here. What are you thinking about the sprint tactics coming up here in just a moment? Yeah, well, it looks like we've got about 80 guys left in this field right now. I don't know how many are going to be left after this KOM. This is going to be full gas. But I think if you're coming into this finish with, you know, 50 guys, which I think is reasonable, it's going to really change this uh, this dynamic of where you're needing to position. As we talked about earlier with the trying to get past people during a full gas sprint, when everyone is pushing, you know, full gas, 14 watts per kilo, 15 watts per kilo, you've got to be doing more. You've got to have, you know, 18 or you've got to have momentum. So it's really interesting to see these riders. Were they at the back coming in with about 600 metres to go? Did they really build their pace and then try and launch? 
I don't know if this is going to be a 300 meter sprint finish. I think this could be full gas from, you know, 800 meters out, really trying to hold your position. And for the climbers, maybe they've got a real shot if they can get far enough in advance, get on the right wheel, catch a really strong sprinter as they come past. They might get towed right the way through to a safe position in top 30. And with less rides in the future races, they've got a really good chance today. So, yeah, I don't know what your, your opinions are on this sprint finish, but oh, it's going to be really exciting. Well, it's changed just a little bit now at this point because they didn't really go bottom to top, it looks like. At this point, it looks to me maybe a couple of attacks go in here, but I think we're going to come to all together, and Severa may have done it, depending on what happens over the top here. A little bit of a press being made here, but uh, also I would say there's the reality of the double kick now. I've heard that a little bit amongst the elites, and I think there's this reality of getting the momentum up early before the sprint actually opens up, finding that position in high speed to get on a wheel that might be accelerating forward, finding yourself amongst that acceleration without too much of an effort used, and then your real sprint opens up. So the double kick, be on the watch out for that, everybody. I think it's really a thing now. Well, over the top of the climb, everything's popping off. 13 seconds, which has it, Matt? This is going to be insane. Thank you very much indeed, guys, for your expert insight. We've got three kilometers to go now in race one of round one. This is loop the loop. And I tell you what, this is absolutely spectacular because our leader now, we thought he'd lose a bit of that lead on the climb, but he's got 12.8 seconds. So he, he seeded uh, Jez 18 seconds, but he's still away. 61 ride-ons for the Italian, 5.4 watts a kilo. But look at what's happening behind. Look at the movement in this yeah. bunch, Jez. Yeah, and it's the names that are boiling up to the front as well. Harvard Gedner is there as well. Ollie Jones, one of our picks from earlier, right up there near the front too. Freddy Ovet, Lionel Voyasan, all rolling up into that top 10. I will remind everyone at home, only the first 30 finishers across the line go into the second of three races in these sprint championships to become the sprint champion this evening. What a ride by Nicolo Severa. He is hanging on to it. Look, he's still knocking out 5.6 watts per kilo on the descent still, back down towards the finish line. Two and a half K to go. This is a heck of a ride, it really is. Severa still clear, as you say, 337 watts. He'll be uh, praying that he can get to that moment where he can have a, that little bit of a respite, where he can get into that super tuck before he then has to go all in for the last kilometre or so, that last 800 metres. But there's a few little, move, little moves coming off the front now. Severa still clear by only 10 seconds, though. Vidal Mel. Another one of the OGs from Norway uh, riding for Movistar has clipped off the front. He's got a small gap on the rest of the bunch. We're looking at the picture-in-picture picture of Vidal Mel. Just under 600 watts. 46 k's an hour before the, the drop-in. Nine seconds now for Severa. Oh, my goodness. The Movistar man is absolutely ripping this. 7.3 watts per kilo. Still on the descent, though, and pushing the pace. You can see him leaning into his bike. He's on the drops there as well. Mel is doing a brilliant ride here, but let's not forget it's about getting through into that second race. We would expect Vidar Mel to be there but he is doing everything to try and close the gap down maybe he wants to take the win here on the loop de loop course to be the first winner on this course let's not forget Matt indeed but he's closing six seconds we've still got 1500 meters to go and you can see you can see the top of your screen there there is Severa the gap is coming down quickly now for Vidar Mel who's opened up himself a six second lead on the peloton but it's the momentum it's the group the pack dynamics behind which are going to favor the bunch but Vidar Mel continues to ride hard this last of 15, 1200 meters are going to go so, so fast. Can Mel, or Vidal Mel, catch up with the Severa? It looks like he might be able to do this. 58 k's an hour into the Super Tuck. The gap, only four seconds now. He is absolutely flying in that Super Tuck too, Mel, as well. Over the bridge, he's closing in on Severa. This is about putting themselves out of doubt, making yes. sure they are in that top 30. But behind them, there'll be some really nervous riders looking around them, looking at where they are within the positions as well. Desperately, get in the top 10 and let the 20 behind you look after them themselves because it's nervous moments if you're 31st that rider who's 31st was so nearly there but didn't make it you cannot leave it to chance here Severa just dangling in front and the catch is about to be made now Vidal Mel is going to go straight past uh, the Italian Severa what a bold move it was but can he hold on to qualify look at that the use of the draft just on the wheel of the Italian coming in to the last 400 meters here Jess 400 meters to go everyone watching will want Nicolo Severa to hang on let's hope he hangs on Matt because he's got the pack breathing right down his neck just what four or five seconds behind him. Hang in there, Nicolo oh, Severa, because oh, oh. it's been the ride of the race so far. Vidal Mel dropping his draft power up for anything it might give him to get him to the finish first. We're looking like we might have a Norwegian winner, or are we? No, we're not. Look at all those power ups being dropped on the line! On the line! Wow! What a finish! 
to the opening race in these Zwift games. If that's anything to go by, Matt, we're in for three incredible weeks. <sighs> Wow. Wow, what a brilliant <laughs> race. I'm sorry, I, I'm all, I, I nearly fell off my chair, Jez. <laughs> that was so, yeah. so entertaining. The first time we've ever done the loop de loop. It does look as if it was in the. We'll get confirmation in a few moments' time. Yeah. It does look like it was Vidal Mel in at the death. Let's hope, let's hope that the Italian managed to hang on because uh, we shall see. Oh. He richly deserves it. It was nice to see you lot giving him, raining down the, uh, the ride-ons on him because he did deserve that, didn't he? It was a big, big... I mean, that was a serious hit out as well. Yeah, I think... Well, I'm not going to presume, but I think we've got the uh, confirmation of the results coming through. Well, there we go. Look at that. Vidal Mel with a brilliant late attack. The Movistar man, the Norwegian, taking the win in this opening race in the sprint championships. Brian Duffy Jr., one of our picks. We heard from him earlier, didn't we? Riding brilliantly, as did Freddie Overt, another of our picks, Matt. Indeed, we're looking down at Josh Harris, Jasper Parandines, Lionel Vuyasan, my pick. <laughs> Thank goodness I can wipe my brow. <laughs> Holden Kumu as well. Uh, Bjorn Andreessen, a solid ride there by the world champion. Adrian Ligruffon and Bart Van Eek. We've got 20 more riders. Mm. So hold on to your hats, everybody at home. Hey, especially if you are cheering anybody on to qualify, because it's only the top 30. Yep. Um, we'll go to so, the next page in just a moment, because that's where it gets even more interesting. It's the Look suspense. At that. Three, three Belgians. The Belgians doing best out of that top ten. Two yeah. Americans. And too. a lot of experience there as well. Look, mm. Here we go. Right. I'm, I'm nervous about that. It's 31 onwards. I'm most nervous about that. But here's the next top ten. This is the second top ten, 11th and 20th. Ollie Jones, the uh, the Kiwi. We talked about him earlier. He was one of our picks, wasn't he? Geoffrey Milieu, the French national champion. Tom Thrall, the Canadian national champion. And then two Germans there, Timon Kruger and Lennart Yashk. Oh, there he is. Our man. Man of the match, I think. Absolutely. Is I mean, I don't know if there's an award for the plus combatif, as the French would say, yep. the most combative rider. But Nicolo Severa has gone through. Right. And this is 21 to 30. Teppo Lario. We mentioned him earlier when we were picking out those uh, ride-on picks. Just ahead of one of, the, uh, one of the most illustriously decorated, I guess, of the Zwifters. Certainly one of the best known. James Barnes, the South African. Ricardo Paniza, the Italian, ahead of Hussein Celebi. And his countryman, Burke Kayen. And then we have Rhinus Vihela of Belgium. Havard Glednis, another very experienced Swifter in 27th. Thomas Perrin there for Great Britain. And the last two riders home, Aika Morel of Spain. And then Ewan Mackey oh. of <laughs> Scotland is the final rider wow. through. So there is your top 30. They're the riders that will be going through to the next round. I need to lie down. Imagine how they I'll tell feel. You what, I'll tell you what, we've got two more races yet to come. We so have. Good to see you and Mackie coming through there. He's a mate of mine. I know you and as well. So he'll be pleased with that. The Scotsman, the tips? last 30th in there. Well, he might need to give some tips after that as well. That was a fun. I think coming 30th in that is just perfect. Literally perfect. Because as we know, Severa and Vidar Mel are going to take a bit of recovery after that, Matt. That's a, that's a big effort. Well, Severo was away. Was it about seven kilometres, yeah. wasn't it? An incredible yeah. ride. I'm so, I'm so glad that he held on. Real deserve. But uh, again, just the speed they came up in, in the last, in the last 50, uh, five, six hundred metres was incredible. But he held on for a solid 16th place. But he is going to need... I don't know what he's going to do. It'd be interesting to see what rides are actually doing now, wouldn't it, behind the scenes mm. in between each of these very, very challenging rounds. But that was spectacular. Great racing. Hope you guys at home are entertained because we've got more of the same. Should we throw across to our two yes, experts? Absolutely. Give ourselves a bit of a rest. Please do. Wow. I, I couldn't keep myself quiet. I mean, that was absolutely insane. And who made it through is a massive, uh, uh, like amazing, these athletes. But then there's also... Adam, we're set, sitting here chatting back and forth about who didn't make it through. We were talking about the timing. We were talking about how high the level is. And also, when you've got so much on the line, the kind of risk rewards, Severa, Mail, both getting through with super late attacks. Both of us were like, what is going on here? The nerves were so high. Adam, first thoughts. I can't believe that finish. I, I cannot believe that 10 seconds came back as well. That's that's the thing that shocks me most. I looked at the gap when Villarmel had about 300 metres to go and he had eight seconds and it was like 0.1 of a second. This tells you just how fast that pack speed is coming off that, that descent. And a lot of people have got that really wrong. A lot of the people that we did expect to make it through have done it, but... Yeah, I was watching and there was a few guys that were too far back and uh, they really they really missed the jump. Um, they maybe left it too late. 
But um, yeah, they just they didn't get through. They they and it's exactly what we talked about with the pack dynamics. When everyone's going full gas, you you can't get past them. So yeah, I, I don't know what you thought, but yeah. I saw the guys that went early really seem to do well. Yeah, and I think that was the thing is those who went with what seemed to maybe be a double kick or maybe just a long drawn out sprint. I didn't really get a good look at how the watts per kilogram were going from earlier on. But uh, yeah, one thing I definitely want to highlight here, big names, second place overall, U.S. national champions, Neil Freyette, not making it through. That is a huge upset. Big climber, probably somebody who, uh, another rider, which is Matthew, uh, Michael Plantherol. He's obviously somebody who can take on the final race at a massive level, maybe even win on that day, not making it through. That's going to upset the overall championship as well. Uh, another, a couple of others here that are definitely names that I was thinking Giel power, Christoph theme, Johan Noren, which was a dark horse pick as well for a lot of us. So man, it, Adam, this obviously, I think you were saying where you're positioned. And I think it's a big learning lesson for the rest of for the next two races, how key that positioning is and how key this, the speed is looking forward to the next course. That lead into that sprint has a lot of high speed into an uphill kick. Again, probably a similar situation where I think these riders are going to come away with some learnings in a, in a pack that's this strong. I think they'll also have seen where their legs probably are. Um, and I think that's going to tell them a lot about the next race. I'm really shocked that, um, that the Italian Severa managed to make it through. When uh, Vidal Mel passed him, I thought he's only going backwards from there. And the fact he was able to dig on and hold on to 15th place in that finish when his legs would have been screaming at him, uh, really chapeau to him. That's an incredible job from him. And I can't wait to see what he's got in the next race because if he does anything, I will be very surprised because I think he'll be pretty sore right now. So. Yeah, yeah, a lot of lot of matches burned. It looked like, and that was I was thinking the same thing. A lot of risk. How much reward? Because he got two more races to go. Well, let's get back over to Jez and Matt to look forward to the next race. Thank you, gentlemen. Well, Matt, I mentioned earlier, didn't I, that that me picking anyone for an overall win was like the kiss of death. I think of all of our predictions this evening, <laughs> the only one who didn't get into that top thirty, Mikel Plantro. Who picked him? Yeah, that'll be me. Sorry, I can only apologise to him. Je suis désolé, as they say. Anyway, whilst they might be out of contention for the day, it's still all to play for for many of those riders, especially those who score some good points. Strong finishes in the next two events would mean they can still feature in the overall, of course, in two weeks' time. Indeed, and I can just see the, the amount of points they've scored on the right-hand side, which they'll take through into the next round, so it's not all over. I'm trying to pick out a few of the key names. We've already picked, well, Kill Power, uh, one of the big Belgians who was a way down um, so that's places 41 to 50, but out of that selection of riders, yeah, Kiel Power will be pretty disappointed with that one. Yep. Uh, James Solchik there, another of the British riders who didn't make it, if I'm not mistaken, Matt, talking as two Brits here, I think there was only one British rider in that top 30 as well to go in through to the finish. Um, uh, yep, he's another of them. Dean Cunningham, another Scotsman also there with JP Leclerc, who we saw rolling up to the front and taking a little bit of a lead too. Indeed. Well, next page, Ed Morgan, unfortunately, John Mould's mm, uh, pick. Um, hasn't gone through, but he will be racing next week, but won't be going through to the next couple of races tonight. Uh, Daniel Benedetti, another rider that's out. Aaron Burrell, we saw Aaron Burrell leading, didn't we? The South African had a good dig off the front of the pack tonight. And I think he might that might be showing just how much it takes out of you by doing that at that point as well. There he is in 71st place as well. Daniel Pettinger, another name there, the Austrian, who's a, is a big hitter. Um, a bit further down, heading towards the, the outskirts of the, the top 90, and uh, Tom Brayer, another one of the Belgians. It's quite clear here, clearly legs play a part, but I do think sprinting with that giant pack uh, without that experience is, um, is, is well, a lot, a lot to learn. And look mm. at that, Jimmy Kershaw, a rider yeah. from Movistar. We know yeah. he's, he's better than that, isn't he? Let's be honest. Yeah, I mean, it, some of this could be tactics, some of it pacing, but just yeah. reading a sprint in a pack that big to try and finish in that top 30. I, I, still, don't, I still find myself thinking, Matt, if I knew I was one of those hitters who's, who's kind of pretty certain I'm going to be top 50, do I try for the win or do I try and be 21st? Exactly. I, I, again, it's all about as being efficient as possible. I mean, just on some of the names we've picked out there, let's throw back across to Adam and Nathan. Go, uh, Nathan, what of the riders that won't be going through to the next race tonight? Is there any surprises there for you? There's one or two for me. Yeah, Alexi Kalman, 
Uh, Jay Brun is there. Obviously, Mikel Plantero. Plantero, not, you know, he was going to have to really set himself up really, really well for a sprint. I would think that, Adam, you'd, you'd agree with that as well, that there's a couple of riders here that their tactics, their positioning would have to be absolutely perfect to even get through on a sprint like that like a climber like Planter or a go at it like Severa. I actually think that some of these riders, you know, and then there's the question, like, would have would have that have been uh, instigating some, some chasers and you're just wasting energy, right? So there's so much of that risk reward. But I definitely would say that Kalman, Nichols, Freyette, all those, it's really between 30 and 45th place. You see a lot of those names, don't you, Adam? Yeah, those are all some of the names that I picked out that I really thought would get through. Nichols particularly, um, it's a real shame, an incredible climber um, and has a really, really strong punch. I think the latter races would have suited him, especially um, the Glasgow crit. So big shame to see him out. Um, and yeah, Hugo, Hugo Viort, um, incredible racer and was 31st there. That's a massive blow. Um, it was 0.8 of a second between 1st and 30th. And yeah. That, that just shows there was such fine margins. So, yeah, he's going to be gutted. Um, and I'm sure there'll be a few riders who were in that 20th to 30th position who are really, really quite thankful because you couldn't hold anything back there. So, um, yeah, so much for energy saving. I don't think anyone would have been doing that there. I think um, it would have been full gas. That's a good point. Yeah. And these riders, though, that didn't make it, we did see the points that they get toward the overall championship. So what can they get back? in the next two races is now going to be on their minds but now we got the top 30 and what's on their minds is going to be the next race with jurassic coast that's what we're looking forward to back to jez and matt yeah the dinosaurs are ready and they are hungry sprint race one is over and we head to the second race with our 30 riders so let's have a quick reminder about that route so now we've got our 30, the dynamics of this next race might be a little bit different, only the top 10 will get through, don't forget to the final race. But this is what they've got set out. It's a point to point course, as we mentioned at the beginning. I had a chance to ride this in the week. In fact, I raced it with a few of our elite riders, Matt. Uh, nearly killed me just to try and stay with them. I'm, as I say, good to, good to I'm, still here. <laughs> I'm alive, I'm alive. This bit here is interesting. You actually ride across the sand and it definitely drags as you hit the sand and go through it. But it is after that point ever so slightly downhill and then that kick to the finish line. The opening half over Titans Grove is the toughest bit, I think. And you never know, we might see some sort of split happen there before they even get to the uh, the aero power up they pick up. Indeed, it's 19.5 k's. That's gonna be, I think, about 25 minutes of, of riding. 212 meters of elevation, as you can see here. Uh, and as you say, it's, it's a race of, of two halves. And although the riders have had an opportunity to ride it, you've had the opportunity to race it. Um, these, these elite riders would never have raced it before. Mm. Um, and although there's a lot of familiar names, a lot of very well high quality Zwift riders, unsurprisingly, in the final, a lot will know each other. There'll be a few in there, because there's only, ten, there's only 10 to go through to the finish. There'll be a few in there that are gonna wake, wanna make it hard early on. Um, and also race, you, you touched on a really interesting point. This has never been raced before. And I have ridden alongside that Jurassic Coast on a few occasions. And there are these surface changes too. Yeah. And that does affect, that does affect yeah. dynamics. There's that added, the, that, 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 that added, added traction. So um, yeah, it's gonna be an interesting race, but those who don't trust their sprint are gonna to have to try something yeah. early. And then when a rider's gonna use that aero power up, it's the, it's the power up that everybody wants, yeah. especially on a flatter finish. So another intriguing prospect, 25 minutes of all out effort. If it's anywhere near as exciting as the last race, we're in for a treat, aren't we? Yeah, we're gonna need a costume change. <laughs> It was really good. Um, very distracting opening as well. The Jurassic Coast route is absolutely beautiful. See how many different dinosaurs you can spot. There's definitely some uh, pterodactyls, uh, brontos, brachiosaurus, uh, triceratops, and Jarvis, the unlucky bear. He's in there too, right at the very end of it. I only spotted him at the last. Why is he so unlucky? I, I don't hey, know. Nathan will know that. We're going to go back to Nathan and Adam. Na Nathan, Nathan, you're the you're the our resident Swift expert. Why is Jarvis so unlucky? Yeah, so every time you go past Jarvis, if you watch him and you're near long enough, because it's not during a race where people are attacking like crazy through that section, of course, 
he's climbing to get honey at the top. There's like a beehive or something, and he always falls backwards onto his back at, at a very specific time. And I think it might be a little bit of a, a key moment of what everybody's experiencing at that section, of course, actually, because that's getting right toward the uh, end of either this direction to climb, or if you're doing the other direction, it's a really good punch, actually, right where Jarvis is, isn't it, Adam? And I think that's the first key moment actually is where Jarvis the bear is yeah we've seen some good moves around there previously in uh, elite racing as well uh, this course particularly on the way out has so many rollers on it and I was looking through the start list just now a couple of the guys in there Kaminsky he's done some really good aggressive moves on the downhill and I think uh, it's gonna be really exciting to see if he pulls something out on this one I think a few teams in there with a few riders yeah, I can't wait to see the team dynamic play out and see if anyone really makes those early moves. Yeah, that's Titans Grove. You can see the entrance there. As they head through the steam springs, there's going to be a little bit of a climb, uh, undulating climbs through the initial lower slopes. There's those steam springs. This section, most likely a whole lot of uh, holding on in the path, just finding your position. But then it starts getting into some rollers and some of those uh, ruler type riders, those larger riders that maybe want to try and make this as hard as they possibly can, could start making moves early on through those sections. And then as they get into the actual Titans Grove climb, they're going to be coming over the top and getting a power up actually. The arrow power up, Adam, I don't think anybody's using that anytime early unless it is completely just roll the dice. I do not want to sprint. I just want to go away like a Severa move that we saw. The only time I would see anybody using that prior to the sprint is they say, forget it. I'm not in for the sprint. I'm only in to get away. Yeah, I think Severo would have loved an arrow last race. Um, but yeah, I, if you use an arrow before the finish line here, you are all in. There is no doubt about it. You want something to work and you're committed to it. Um, and it's kind of a telltale sign um, if you are using that early on. Yeah, 100%. 100%, 100%. Well, let's go ahead and jump down into the reaction as they have gotten out on course. There you go. Uh, Nathan Guerra is Mr. 100%, 100%. That's 200%, isn't it? Um, it's got to be. It's just, just pure hey, maths. Look at the size of that pack, Matt Stevens. Look at the size of that pack. Only 30. Radically different to the 170 we had in our first of three races this evening. There's our winner, Vidar Mel, winner of round one. He looks perky at the front, but will it last? Because anyone who's made a big hit out, and I still think this is the case, anyone who's made a big hit out in that first race at some point not has to pay for it, but might pay for it. There is Vidal Mel as well. One of the things I've noticed about him, Matt, he's, of all the riders, he's the one who seems to be sat down the most. I don't think I've seen him out the saddle so far, despite how hard he was going in that last race. Yeah, I, I mean, riders use different techniques. It's like on like uh, IRL as well. There, there are certain techniques to, uh, to riding on Zwift and getting the power out uh, as efficiently as you can, keeping the heart rate down. Um, what we do see... Um, in Zwift in particular is a high torque kind of low cadence work going on um, but remember a lot of these riders are exceptionally good out on the road as well and uh, remember these skills are transferable but it is very interesting how versatile and how adaptable the human body is um, and how you see different riders trying different sorts of styles especially when you factor in the, the pack dynamics looking at Ollie Jones uh, was, <laughs> I think he might have been on Facebook there to be honest he's so casual isn't he is Ollie Jones looking good there he is. He's a proper, as you say, one of our OGs, such a uh, versatile rider, has finished very, very strongly earlier on. And like you said before, mm. I mean, um, a lot of riders who are in this final have had to go on very deep. I have a feeling that the likes of Ovet, uh, the likes of, um, let's say, Johannesson, a few of those are so, so experienced and also our, our, our world champion too. I reckon... They're that good that they've actually done the minimal that they needed to qualify. Uh, it's yeah. a risky strategy, yeah. but because of what we've got to come, you need to save some energy, especially if you're going to back yourself to be in the top, the final top 10 race, you've got to have a little bit left in the tank. Yeah. You can't go into that race empty. So they, although you've got to get through each round, you do have to do that with a slightly long-term thing in mind. Otherwise, you're going to be completely empty. It's a, that's why I love this format. It really does mix it up. It makes riders think differently. I think it's a really disruptive uh, style of racing, and I absolutely love it. This is one of those little bits of downhill where you've, uh, you've just got to roll into it. I was on my Wahoo trainer in the week, and this is one of those courses that really shows you the, the load and then the release of load and yep. the load that you're getting from your smart trainer all the time as you're riding it. 
and uh, I'm still quite new to that trainer actually and getting that smart trainer load and it's this is the course which really does display it at its best if you ever want to test out a trainer I would suggest riding something like this stretch of road on the Jurassic Coast course which is now open of course uh, is a great way of testing it out right Tepo Lario we mentioned him earlier he looks cool as a cucumber the in shot well. there doesn't he yes he's gone for the aero haircut as well um He's got a little bit of a lead. He's just floated off the front. I mean, it's, uh, as you said, you're quite right. I don't. He's not committed. He's not actually committed with that. It's almost as if he was just testing the water there. Because look how relatively relaxed he is. Anybody watching, and most of you will know what it's like to try and put out 360 watts. And again, he was breathing through his nose. Just shows how how, how good and how um, the shape that uh, Tepo Lorio is in. Another little move here as well. And I think these riders just drifting off the front. I don't know if that's a big necessarily a big attack. He's only doing four and a half watts a kilo. A kilo. I think what it what it is, it's about where different riders apply the pressure here. You can move up or, or move back very quickly on this yeah. undulating yeah. stretch of road. Should we throw to the guys? Just, yeah. just to get them to explain a little bit about how complex, it doesn't look it, but how complex this opening few k's is. Uh, Nathan, this particular section on Titans Grove leading to the climb, it's... You really need to know how to ride this. This is a, a real, like, Zwift expert section of road, isn't it? Because if you know how to ride it, you can benefit so much, can't you? Yeah, it depends on what the front of the pack is doing. But if you can time things correctly, you can gain so much speed without a whole lot of effort. And you're seeing that from Pepe Lorio, Bjorn Anderson, Brian Duffy Jr. is now covering things, I think. And a few of these riders are covering things who want this to more come down to a all-out kick their confident. This is a different race situation now, though, too. You've only got 30 riders. With less of a pack and less of this crazy speed momentum over the top, over the top, over the top, the pure sprinters are going to be a little bit more confident, or the purer sprinters more confident. And, Adam, I want you really to speak to this. You know, don't you think that there's going to be a situation here where there's riders who just know, I can't. I just, it's just almost impossible for me to play it right against some of the power that's here Couple loyal being in my mind here. Bjorn Anderson maybe even being somebody here that's like, I'm just going to have to make this as hard as I possibly can because some of these riders are going to outkick me no matter what I do. Yeah, this is the course where if you've got a really good sprint, you're just going to be able to win that finish. You can be really, really trusting in that sprint, far more so than the previous one. And uh, Jasper Paradan, who we're seeing on screen right now, I think he'll be one of those guys who is super confident in his sprint. Um, so, yeah, don't expect to see much from him, I, I imagine. Uh, he might follow some moves, but uh, I think we'll probably see him really kicking hard in that final 20 seconds for the win. What is most interesting for me here is there's five next guys in this field. They might not be working fully together as a team, but I can be pretty sure that they won't be chasing each other. And that move that we saw from Perrin early doors, I think that's telling of what's going to come in these next uh, 10K, 15K or so. Um, I don't know what they're going to plan. I don't know what you would plan if you were, you know, the next DS, but or it's going to be really exciting, I think, with that many guys from one team in here. We talked about this a lot, actually, on the podcast, that next or they're going to look, and some of these teams are going to look to stack this uh, field as much as they possibly can to get five out of 30 is that right that there's five did we do our math right that is a pretty I'm good percentage of the pack you can play some games you can play some games with that i mean we and these are five of the strongest athletes in the world uh i am seeing four next jerseys and i believe also the national six. championship six, uh, jersey there so six Woo. so yeah, yeah definitely. I, I see they've who, got Nikki the numbers who. i think they're gonna do the work at them yeah, Nicky Hoog, Zach Nair, James Barnes, uh, Thomas Thrill we saw at the back there, Tom Perrin. They've got lots of guys in here, and it's going to be super exciting. Uh, just waiting for the fireworks to start really now. Yeah, well, they're going to be hitting the climb right now. I actually think they are starting the climb here. So let's get back over to Jez and Mez. They call the action. Thank you, guys. They've got just over a kilometre to go to the top of Titans Grove. That is where they'll pick up that... Aero power up as we look at Lionel Voyasan um, out of the saddle, bobbing away with the familiar headband on as well. He's not quite at the front, he's right in the middle of that pack, just hiding in there at the moment as well. 
Uh, Ewan Mackey, the Scotsman that I mentioned earlier, right at the front as well. Looking like they're all still together. Let me remind you, only 10 riders will progress from this to our final race this evening to become the sprint champion of the Zwift Games, and that will be contested on the Glasgow Crit Circuit. Don't forget, folks, if you want to follow the same kind of data that Matt and I are enjoying in the studio here, just follow the link which is on screen now, the Zwiftgames.link forward slash race dashboard to get all that data. You can scroll up and down as well. Use the little scroll buttons at the bottom and they'll scroll you down a few more. This race, you haven't got to scroll down too far because there are only 30 riders in it too. And you're getting some nice in-screen shots as well. You can actually see what's going on with the rider. Really useful having a tablet or a laptop maybe open alongside you while you're watching this. Yeah, we're just uh, on that picture and picture, we've just seen Bjorn Andresen, our world champion, just uh, drift over the top of that climb with Harvey Glednes, another rider who's very, very powerful from Norway, representing the Movistar team. So a good little breakaway. Thought we might get a couple of little moves over the top of that climb. And uh, oh, what a good break it is. Harvey Glednes mm -hmm. and Bjorn Andreasen now have four second lead over the other 28 riders being led by Lionel Vuyasan. My tip for the overall, by the way, 27 riders. By the way, although the ride-ons that you'll be giving to the riders won't count towards the ride-on classification or the jersey, they still do. Well, this is still yeah. great. They, it just yeah. makes a difference when a rider can see them. So please... Do fire up your companion apps. And as well as doing that, as giving ride-ons to your, to your fellow riders, get, let, let us know what you think so far of the Zwift Games. And thanks so much, wherever you are in the world, for joining us. Uh, we hope you join, uh, join us for the rest of the, the last, next couple of weeks as well as we head over to the Epic and then, and then the climb in two weeks' time. Uh, we really want to know what you think. And remember, as well, at the back end of the programme, we'll be telling you how you guys can get involved and race and ride on these courses too, as... That little breakaway was just caught. An interesting little move, that one, wasn't it? Absolutely. They are the words of Matt Stevens, former British national road race champion. My name's Jez Cox, and we are bringing you the opening day of racing this uh, weekend. Every, well, the first three weekends in March, we're bringing you the whole of the inaugural Zwift Games, the first ever event of its kind. Enormous prize fund at the end of this. Cash, real cash. Um... And, uh, and lots of other prizes too along the way, including cash preems along the way as well. Cash sprint prizes as well, which is something that's going to be extremely exciting to watch. Right now, though, it's all about the whittling down of this group 210. All back together, Vidar Mel still hugging the front. Let's not forget the Movistar Man was the winner of the opening race. There we have, there we have definitely a Brachiosaurus in the middle. And a couple of what my son calls them headbutters. I think that's not actually the, the biological name for it. Um, but you can see what I mean. It's that there's little. Some, there's some little velociraptors as well running yeah. on the side. I hope they don't get okay. involved because yeah. the uh, yeah the, the the governing body will have a yeah. field day. But thankfully, they were kept off the road. Clearly, fans of cycling and appreciate a, a fair fight <laughs> out on the road here. As we look at Bart van den Eckout looking pretty relaxed. Do you know what this feels so far to me? Quite tactical. Yes. Quite cagey. Nobody's yeah. really launched. We saw that little attack earlier on from Bjorn Andreasen, who was mm. joined afterwards. They didn't really commit, uh, commit to that one. Let's throw across again to Adam and Nathan just to see what they... Th I thought this might be, there might be a lot more attacking because we're moving on to the slightly easier terrain. It's undulating, maybe some little springboards. But Adam, what do you think? This feels to me, just looking at the watts per kilo, very, very cagey, exceptionally tactical so far. I'm I'm pretty surprised to be honest. I thought uh, I thought exactly as you say we'd see a lot more attacks. I think maybe um, the amount of next dominance in this field is maybe putting people off. I think if you are from another team, it's really risky if they do use one rider even just to drill it on the front to bring that back. Although well, we're starting to see moves now, it looks like. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's nervy. Um, People will want to get away, but they need the right group and there needs to be the right people in it. Um, and yeah, what well, we're seeing. Lionel Vyarsin, Bjorn Andreasen and Michael Kaminsky, all three of them would probably want to work, but they're going to keep getting covered by next riders. And so, yeah, the next 10Ks, I don't know what's going to happen, but I think a break of three, maybe, you could see go and the sprinters still be happy. It's That's the question. Uh, how confident are you in your sprint? Um, yeah. I'd be interested to see what, uh, what you think, Nathan, but there's clearly some moves starting to stick now, and uh, I think we will start to see a gap grow. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. The uh, Bjorn Anderson's attack over the top, I think probably there was a little bit of a panic, I thought, there for a moment, but then the riders did start to work together to bring things back. It got out to three seconds or so, and I thought maybe it was going to stick, but 
I think this is what we're going to see all the way until we actually hit the flats of Tempest Fugit in the right-hand turn off over to the coast because you can work with these sections. As Matt had said earlier, this section of Titan's Grove as well as the section, is actually almost all of Titan's Grove, you can work with these little undulations a lot to gain a lot of speed, punch over the top, and put people out the back with not a whole lot of effort, and then commit. That's going to be the question. And one thing I, with that word commit, I think, is... How many riders can get away with the sprinters being happy is going to be a big question about what people commit to out on course here as there's only 10 spots and whether or not you're willing to risk things. Now, it is all back together, though, so interesting here. Uh, let's head back over to Jez and Matt, I think, as I think we're about to head down into the Tempest Fusion sections in just a moment here as the tax slow down. Yes, thank you, Nathan. These roads will be very familiar, as you say, from Tempest Fugit. Uh, as we're continuing to just jag up and down, it's jagged terrain, but we're going net downhill because we're headed for the beach. We're nearly done with the dinosaurs, in fact, the Jurassic part of this Jurassic Coast course, and nearly down onto uh, the edge of the seaside. It'll get sandy as well once we enter that point, too. Things have calmed down. We saw a classic example there of just... It's like, you know, wasps or bees stinging, isn't it, Matt? One or two give a little sting and suddenly they're swarming at the front end and there were some big digs being thrown down. Exactly. And when we've only got 30 riders and when you look at some of the riders here, they, they all know each other. There's a couple of riders who I don't know too much about, but there's also about 20 of them here are very familiar. They'll know their strengths. They'll know their weaknesses. There's probably, I reckon, 10 or 15 that you could back to finish, maybe not 10 or 15, but maybe five or six riders who could almost guarantee they'd finish in front. And that's why we're seeing it almost like neutralized here. They know each other so well, they know the riders they don't want to let go. And also, as Adam said, you know, next esports have got six riders here. And now, I don't think they'll be working entirely as a collective. It's all about the individual win. But what they won't do is chase each other down. That's for sure. That, just, that is just a no-no. So, so that gives them, I think, a little bit of an advantage. Um, and again, there's going to be far less communication going on between teams here as well. We normally see in these Rift games that communication is key. Communication in any sort of bike racing is key, especially in a team race uh, where they'll yeah. use Discord. But here, it's going to be a little bit different. So a lot of rides are going to be on their own a bit but um, and again you don't get quite the element of surprise and as we move on to this slightly flatter section there's going to be less options I think to actually go clear but as you pointed out earlier on once we get onto the sand that's quite yeah. sticky so I'm wondering if anybody's going to try anything on the sand to try and open up a little bit of a gap. I think what we're seeing here is remarkable, Matt, as well, because I really did think Vidal Mel, having won the first race, would back off a little bit in here. But look at the watts he's laying down. He's, he's just gapping them ever so slightly. Yes, we're slightly downhill here, but he knows where he is. And he's persisting with this kind of just slightly higher tempo at the front to see if he can tease something away from the rest of them. I'm surprised at that because, yes, it shows he's recovered well, but if he's going to get into this top 10 and then be in that final round. We know how far the, how hard the course in, in the Glasgow City crit is with its multiple ascents of that Clyde kicker. You've got to save something for that. Exactly, but what that also says to me, and when you look at Vidal Mel over the last few years, he is a rider that always races aggressively. I don't think he'd be doing it. We saw, who, who was it? it? was Freddie Ovette said his style is naive racing. I don't think uh, Vidal Mel is naive at all. Um, seven watts a kilo, drifting off the front. An interesting one. I totally agree with you, but he's clearly feeling very good. You wouldn't do that if you weren't feeling good. And maybe he just wants to test. Maybe he wants to try and see uh, these little testing moves off the front. I think are just to see what sort of response uh, uh, is elicited. Um, multiple national champions in this front group as well. It is a group of hitters. Thrall is there, the Canadian champion. Our world champion drifts through to the front in the rainbow bands. We've got Kaminsky there, the Polish champion too. We've got the French champion in the mix. It is just a who's who of the best races on Zwift. Yes, I'm just looking, Matt. I think we've lost a few here as well. It doesn't look like 30 riders, but anyway, we'll keep an eye on that. Just gonna, uh, no, we're all... Yeah, we uh, are we, all we there. I'm one rider. I'm we have it. lost one rider and uh, we've got 29 riders maybe one rider's had a bit of a mechanical or something or a dropout i'm not too sure but we do have 29 riders in the front group including josh harris who's currently out of the saddle 
Um, getting a good look. It looks to me as if it's in the garage. I do like to be a bit nosy. I mm. do like these pictures and pictures. Not just because the style of the rider. I'm just a bit of a nosy person. Yeah, absolutely. I like to see what's going on in their pain caves. You know, my favourite one, Matt, is when we can actually see out of the window as well. Because I always like to see where they are. And you suddenly remind yourself that sometimes it's night where they are, or it's day, or it's nice and hot outside. These riders are spread all over the uh, all over planet Earth, and yet they're in this one peloton together. That is the beauty of Zwift, isn't it? And particularly of Zwift racing, where we can watch it. How much are these pictures come on? Our broadcast quality. I'm, I'm kind of bigging up what we're doing, but the broadcast quality no, has improved so much. Look at the, the way we're tracking these riders. There's something about this, Matt, which is actually better than watching real racing in real life because you, don't, you never get to see it like that. No, it, it, I, I think that pulling all this thing together, I mean, that there's WIF Games, it's the inaugural WIF Games, as we said at the top. It, there's no, been lo nothing quite like it at all. Um, but, but also when you look at the, the, the technical aspect, bringing all these riders together, we've got picture in picture of every single rider that started. And the, the race earlier on today, 160 odd riders, and we had a video of every single one. So it really is a heck of a logistical feat as we look at the British rider, Thomas Perrin, one of the next esports riders out in front. A couple of riders now trying to test the ground. So just under seven k's to go. The race speed has picked up. It was a, a relatively pedestrian 35, 36 k's an hour a few minutes ago. But things have started to pick up. We've got six and a half kilometers to go with this increase in pace. Let's throw across uh, to Nathan and Adam again. Nathan, things appear to be coming to the boil. A kind of steady um, little part coming off Titans Grow, but now the pace is starting to pick up. Well, now the pressure is on for those that do not want a sprint. And Adam was just actually texting over to me with a list of riders that he thinks do not want to sprint at all. And we're starting to see them come across. Adam, who are those riders you're thinking that are going to be thinking, look, we need to break this because they know that they don't have a good chance in an all-out sprint? You're seeing them on screen. Um, yeah, Bjorn Andreasen keeps animating it. It's the same guys always at the front. They're always wanting to make a move, see if something will stick because they prefer the safe option potentially of trying to get up the road. Um, and it's, yeah, Thomas Perrin, uh, Nicky Hoog and uh, Zach Neer all from Next in particular that I'm really looking at. And we just saw Perrin and Neer really animating a minute ago. They keep going to the front. They keep trying to do stuff. And... Um, it's clear they want something to go and um yeah our winner oh sorry i'm not our winner but uh, the italian from last race severa he keeps trying to make little little digs off the front i just think they're all coming up against a brick wall trying to think how do i fix this problem how do i get off the front in a position that works for me i i don't know and um yeah if if you were one of these riders how would you get clear nathan it, there's a lot of rollers here but what what do you need to do yeah, I do think that it's going to be about jumps. It's going to be about timing. We do see w, uh, a couple of WLC riders here now making moves off the front. And I think you were saying that's going to be one of your team members, Salibi, I believe it is. And he's making a little bit of a move. You were saying he doesn't have much of a sprint. And this is a little bit less known rider amongst the top, top level here. They may give him a little bit of something to work with, which might be interesting here. 5.5 watts per kilogram. A couple of people goes back. And really, it was about... How many times are people going to respond, I think? Uh, there's also, I, coming into the final few kilometers here, we got about 4.8, 4.7 to go. I think that things are going to really pop. The real fireworks, the real pressure, the real timing of when everybody goes, this is now or never. We're going to have two options coming up in front of us. It's either going to be a situation where everybody goes, well, it's not going to work out the way I thought it would. We have to just have a full-on sprint against some of the best sprinters in the world. Or... It's going to be absolutely bonkers risk like we saw some, from Severa. I think we're probably going to see that second option, though. Adam, what do you think? Yeah, I think so. Um, although I've got to say, Teppo did a really good job there. I think he was blocking. Uh, I think he was blocking at the front of the pack, trying to stall the pace, make people have to do a really hard surge around him to push the pace. And it's given Celebi that lease. And yeah, three seconds, it might be enough. If people don't work, they're all thinking about the sprint. Three seconds is all we need. And... They might let one rider go. They might let two riders go. Will they let three or four? Oh, it's, it's starting to get really exciting. Yeah, back to you guys in the studio. Let's see what the, you have to make of all this. Oh, thank you, Adam. That is the Turkish rider, Hussein Salibi, still hanging on to that very, very slender lead. Geoffroy Milieu was the rider trying to go across to him, but it's been snuffled out a little bit. There's so much bubbling going on at the front of that peloton. It's looking more and more, Matt, I hate to say it, like it's going to come down to a big sprint between them. But this is a great ride by Salibi. It is. Um, one of his favourite things to do when he's not Zwifting 
is gambling. And this is a big gamble. He is rolling the dice uh, to coin a cyclist commentator. <laughs> this is a cliche, but he's rolling the dice here. But he's, he's not just rolling the dice. He's putting out some big, big numbers. But I think the beauty of the Zwift games is we're seeing the net being spread a little bit wider. More and more riders have had mm. the opportunity to race its elite level. We are making discoveries here yep. at the elite games yep. as we're breaking new ground. And he's still out in front by 2.7 seconds. Leonard Jass is moving through. Paradigms at the front as well. Uh, it's looking ever... Well, ever more likely that this is going to come down to a sprint. But uh, our man out in front is doing a heck of a run. Look at that. Still holding just under or just over six watts a kilo. A massively impressive ride by the man out in front, Silebi. And what, what makes it even more fascinating, Matt, is, is he's a Turkish rider. Look down that list of riders there. How multinational is that? Zwift is a far more multinational racing uh, environment than anything in real life. Absolutely. If you look at all the different nations that are represented and where they are literally around the world as well, it's fantastic to watch. He is still riding away with this. He has um, nearly seven and a half seconds over Kaminsky, who leads that peloton behind of, what, 28 riders, we believe, who are chasing him. I will remind viewers, there are just 10 riders from this race that will go into the final race tonight on Glasgow City Centre. There is an attack coming from behind, though. This is Lennart Yash. The, no, it's not, sorry, it's Milieu again, the French champion trying to bridge the gap. Good move here. And Celebi still holding on out in front. Um, he was asked his weakness... Uh, YOLO, no sprint. That's why he's out in front. So he's gambling. He's got no sprint. And this is the only way to do it. So we're still clear. But as you said, Milor is now coming across the gap. Still five and a half seconds to close. He in turn has been reabsorbed by Ricardo Panizza and Lionel Villasan. Also in the mix, Brian Duffy Jr., the American champion. Those national champion grouped together. They're now starting to thin out 2.3 kilometers to go. This is really hotting up. But the, the man out in front is still there. Still holding six and a half watts a kilo. This is seriously impressive. Nicolo Severa was the man of the match in the opening race, and so far, definitely, Hussein Salibi is the man of the match in this second race. Yes, it's a slightly shorter race, but it's been all about one climb and one very long, jagged descent to bring them right the way down to sea level and the finish in Squashcotch Sprint. Look at him in the picture, in shot there, Matt. He is going through a world of pain, but I tell you what, he would richly deserve this. Make sure you give him a ride on, because he very much Please deserves do. far more than 13. Get your phone out, get your app out and give him a ride on. He deserves it. Indeed, indeed. Please do fire it up because this is a heck of a ride. We've, been, we've seen already tonight some ma massively entertaining Zwifting. It really is great. I'm enjoying the Zwift game so far. I hope you at home are too. Please get involved in the comments below. Tell us what you think. 1,600 metres to go. And guess what? He's built his lead up to seven seconds now. What a turn up this would be. The man from Turkey out in front. Looks like he's starting to fade now. Is it The, the ride-ons have gone up, but it's wow. Paradigms in second place. Eight seconds now, 1,400 metres to go. This is a combination of an absolutely brilliant ride being done out front by Hussein Salebi. We can see him in shot right there. A combination of his uh, supreme dominance out front and that little bit of tactics coming into the play. They're all now starting to think about uh, second to tenth that will get them into this final race. You've come this far. You definitely don't want to be outside. You don't want to be 11th or anywhere behind it. Hussein Salebi is trying to put it beyond doubt. Like we said with the first race, Matt, if he gets caught inside this final kilometre now, I can't see him hanging on. So it's absolutely all in. Still, 6.5 watts per kilo. And nobody, apart from Jeffrey Muller, has deployed the, their, their aero power-up. Remember, that's the power-up you want in the sprint. Muller has gone clear, so he in turn has got five seconds over the bunch behind. It currently being led by Lonu Viersan, who already has opened things up, clearly going for a long sprint, 11 watts a kilo, coming into the last 750 metres. Miller, the French national champion, looks like he's going to sweep past Hussein Selen, who's still in front. Can Miller hold on? The bunch are moving. 500 metres to go here, Jess. Oh, Salebi's just seen the trickle or streak past him. Now, Mulura is also fully committed this. 584 watts. He's got to hang on and try and stay out front. He should see himself going into the final if he's not caught. But look at the surge, Matt. Look at the surge coming from behind as riders are going to try and push through and punch out of this group to be involved in this sprint. Look at the riders coming from the back to the front as well. Bjorn Andreasen is the next of those to make a big dig. 10 go through to the final round. We're into the final 200 metres. Mulura is hanging on. Salebi is hanging on. But will he? Salebi's being caught. Look at the power-ups being dropped as well. Oh my goodness. And who's going to survive the finish? Hyvind Glednes is going to take this by the looks of it on the line. Glednes, the Norwegian, by the looks of it, taking the win. We'll confirm this for you but provisionally. We said how tricky that finish was as well, Matt. How quick was that? Wow. That was amazing <laughs> stuff. I mean, we'll get confirmation in a few moments about the top 10. But to tell you what, 
30 started, only 10 go through to the final round. There's some big hitters yep. who have missed out. Yep. So this is this is what this is all about. It's fascinating, this process of elimination. But what a move there but by the by the rider from Turkey. That was bold. He knew he didn't have a sprint, but he entertained us. He rode with real panache. Uh, we'll have to pick the bones out of that one. But another brilliant race. It took a little bit of time just to come to the boil. Very tactical. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We didn't see it explode like we thought on yep. Titan's Grove. But then as we headed in towards the finish, the catalyst being that, that, that attack from the Turkish rider, uh, but uh, a fantastic sprint. Let's see who's qualified for the final round tonight, because that, that was great. I've got my fingers crossed for Hussein Salabi. I want yes. him to be in the top 10. Ooh, I'm looking I think at some up. We'll bring you these results on the screen in just a moment, guys. Some of you will be able to see them. They're ready. Let's have a look. Ah! Oh, he, he didn't, didn't make, make it. it. He didn't make it's it. Just cruel. I did, I, ah. Where are the judges? I need to complain. I've got to find something to complain about. Salabi so deserved to be in that final, but that is the way the racing goes. You said it yourself, Matt. He rolled the dice and he's outside the top 10. What a shame. Well, anyway, anyway, let's focus who is on in there. Gavid Gleznes with perfect timing, the Norwegian in the end. Just 0.1 of a second ahead of Thomas Thrall. Now, if you notably, Matt, most of these names we haven't really mentioned in that second race. They were hiding, waiting. Well, only one of the top five riders that we previewed has gone through. Bjorn Andreasen isn't there. We'll talk about them in a minute. Duffy Jr., Ovet, Paradigm's not there. So let's continue through. James yep. Barnes. Bart Van Eko of Belgium, Johannes Keiding of Sweden, Vidar Mel making it two Norwegians in the final, the only country to get yep. two in the final. Teppo Lorio, one of those popular riders out there for Finland. Kaminski, the Polish champion there too. Josh Harris also there, and the only American in the top 10, Holden Kummi, the only rider from the former, uh, the former American champion has gone through. So a real mixed bag, a proper international flavor. Wow. Breathless stuff, but I think a lot of surprises there. A lot of surprises for me. Absolutely. And as you mentioned, not only one Norwegian winning it, but two Norwegians in that top 10. Proper, proper multinational top 10 as well. Really impressive to see. Notably, by the way, Vidar Mel, our Norwegian winner of the first sprint race this evening, making it through to the final. So he's going to be a big threat. He's survived well, hasn't he? He is indeed. Well, we've had a look and had our view. Uh, let's throw over to uh, Nathan and Adam for your view, guys. Explosive stuff. Took a bit of time to get to the boil, but that's an interesting top team we've got there. Two words. Zwift. Craft. 100%. I mean, Teppo Lorio, where he was positioned in that sprint... Teppo, for me, the reason I said earlier on that he was attacking is like, how does he go up against Arvid Jeldins and Holden Kamu, who are obviously pure sprinters, making it through Adam? This just goes to show how much Zwiftcraft and knowing the game absolutely matters 100% with a guy like L'Oreal. I would say Josh Harris as well. Yes, he's a rider who's got an amazing high FTP and he's got a pretty good kick, but at the same time, the pure wattage... It seems to me that those who really, really did their homework ended up taking this down because riders at Bjorn Anderson, the world championship, went way too early, it looked like to me, Adam. Yeah, Swiftcraft is definitely the uh, the order of the day today. Um, yeah, you and Mackie as well. I think he was the fastest in the sprint, but he was too early. And uh, it completely, like, he hit, the draft, he hit the front too early and... He just let everyone out, unfortunately, for him. And I think he had a really good shot there. So I'm sure he'll be very disappointed. Um, and yeah, Brian Duffy Jr., he made a really big effort with about, oh, I think it was about 1K to go. He was trying to follow um, the attack from Millor. And you can't spend matches at that point in the race. You've got to make that call. And he was probably the reason the Millor got caught. But he was also the reason that he didn't make it through, I think. You put yourself out of position, you don't prep properly for that final 500 meters and you're in big trouble. So yeah, it's really, really big shocks and um, a, a couple of really dangerous sprinters in that top 10 who I think is going to be very exciting in the final race. Yeah, risk reward is what it was all about. Well, looking forward to the next race. Let's go on over back to Jason Matt. Thank you, gentlemen. So we know that Holden Comieux, the American, was 10th. Let's dig into those murky waters of who didn't make it, Matt, shall we? Well, it's a who's who, isn't it? It's all of our favourites, basically. So, uh, but there we go. Remember, they do score points, though, going uh, towards the overall. So it's not all over. We've got two more races next week, but they won't be going through to the final tonight. Paradigm's one of the favourites, isn't there? Zach, well, all of these, yeah. to be honest with you, yep. Paradigm's, Zach Nair, Freddie Ovet, Lionel Villasun, Nicky Hug, 
Uh, that is some of the finest Zwifters out there, and they didn't quite get it right, unfortunately. Uh, but there we go, lessons learned. And I think when you look at it, maybe it was the uniqueness of the finish, because we've never had a race finish there. No. So opening no. up the finish at top speed off the back of an interesting attack, that was the first time they've ever done it. Yep. It's not as if that was a familiar finish. Let's have a look at 20th to 30th as well to see who really got it wrong. <laughs> I hate doing this. We're sort of wallowing in their uh, disappointment. We'll come to it in just a second, though. But it, did, it is striking for me, Matt, seeing so many of the best names, the best known names, the biggest Swifters, so close together. Is there the possibility, like, I don't necessarily think it's the case, but I don't know what you think, that they, they're watching each other so much, they get confident in who's in their surroundings and then miss the point that they, they needed to sprint sooner? Quite possibly. I think it was just, it was just there was so few people, a uh, few riders in that group. Here is the uh, the last 10 who didn't get through. Um, Rhinus Verheller, Adrian Le Cruffon, a few names we yeah. don't really know as well, Ike Morel, Brian Duffy Jr. and Bjorn Andreessen. What a duo there, yeah. the world champion and Brian Duffy Jr. out. Yep. Uh, and that's a surprise. It is. And, and look at this as well. Geoffroy Milieu and Hussein Salebi, the two animators of the race really, put it all on the line and they've ended up not qualifying, coming to coming almost last in the race, pretty much. And that they deserve more than that because they've really stuck their necks on the block, haven't they? They had to commit, but we do know it, they all know if you if you if you get the timing wrong and you do start to fade when you're you're only holding five and a half six watts a kilo and the bunch behind with an aero power up, with momentum. Are, are, are sprinting at 12, 13 watts a kilo. It's amazing how much ground you can shut up. I mean, look at it, it's like in the real world when you've got a bunch sprint and a single rider who's fading. It's very similar, always very, very hard. And, and as, as we heard, both of those riders needed to go long. They nearly yeah. pulled it off, yeah. but they didn't quite do yeah. it. But it's provided us with a, a brilliant entertaining. Yep. The, the Zwift Games, it's about the, Zwift, the best Zwift riders in the world entertaining us. This is what it's all about. But I, but I do think your, your point was a good one. The, the small amount of riders, the uncertainty, and a finish that's been used for the very first time all played uh, their part. Um, riders just weren't familiar with that finish, and some of the best riders in the world got it wrong. Favourite course of the two so far tonight? I like them all, really. I quite like the place to place. The whole place yeah, to place yeah, element, like apart from the Alpe de Zwift, is something we never get on, mm. uh, in, in, in Zwift racing, and I quite like it. It's a completely different feel, and it's yeah. hard to get used to. Mm. Right. That sprint race two, that's over and done with. So now we head on to the third race with our 10 riders ready. So let's have a quick reminder of the route, shall we? Yep. Now it's the same finishing course as used for the World Championships, those UCI World Championships in 2023. Question is, will we see someone go long like Andreasen did? It's a very short circuit, but that climb, and I'll say it again, the climb of Clyde Kicker is a brute. It is based on the now famous, infamous Montrose Street, uh, where we saw Matthew van der Poel throw down his big attack. That was a crippling climb, but I have to admit, it's even tougher on this course, I think, in Zwift. It's a really, really tough climb. Five laps, Matt, as well. Yeah, five laps, as you said, five, five times up the Clyde Kick. It's only short, it's only about 300 metres, but it goes up to about 10, 12%. Uh, and then there's not really much recovery over the top. You have to keep the power down. Uh, I think it's a great finale. Shorter distance, 15.3 Ks. Um, short, certainly not sweet. It's gonna be amazing. We've got a really interesting mix of riders. I cannot wait for this to kick off. I really can't. I've been entertained all night so far, and this is gonna be a thrilling final. Yeah, I hope you're enjoying it as much as we are at home. I'm absolutely certain you are. Um, just before we go to the racing, let's just maybe get Nathan and Adam's take on the course and how they yeah. think it's going to be raced. Quite a lot of these riders, of course, would have raced in those UCI World Championships last year. Uh, we know Bjorn Andresen's out of it now. He hasn't qualified for that final 10. He won't be in this last race. So an opportunity for some to try their hands. Some of these riders, maybe, bearing in mind there's a few slightly lesser known riders in there, might not have been in those World Championships a year ago either. So... Um, Chaps, how do you think this is going to be taken on on this course? Only five laps, lots of corners too. Yeah, thanks, Jess. So this is course and riders here. And what is, where do they shine is what it's going to come down to and who's got the energy. We've got three different types of riders, really. Uh, Harvard Geldings, on Kamu on this course specifically, probably more your pure sprinters, I would say, Adam. Uh, Adam, when it comes to your riders who just want to completely decimate this, Josh, Harris, Vidar, Mail, who else in that, in that, to try and just like, from the get-go, get away? They were definitely the first two names that sprung out to me. Josh Harris, I definitely had down as a good dark horse for this. I thought the sprint, maybe on uh, race one, would be too hard for him, but now he's here. I really, really do like his chances to make something happen. Um, in terms of names that want to break away, 
I think it's just going to an opportunist. Anyone who sees an opportunity, anyone can take this race to the breakaway. Everyone in here can do, you know, five watts per kilo, 20 minutes sort of thing. They can all do these breakaways. They can all make it stick. It's going to depend on the, the group dynamics. People want to chase. People are hurting. We've got an hour of really hard racing in the legs now. People just want to be just conserving that little bit for the finish. They start to sit on a move. And before you know it, you know, like we saw with Celebi just then, 10 seconds appears and suddenly it might not come back. Um, it's going to be really tight. I think Horvath Yelnez is going to be really difficult to beat in this finish. Um, but I don't know. Who, who's your pick for this? How, how do you think it plays out? Is it going to be a sprint finish or is it going to be a break? Well, obviously, Clyde Kicker every time around, but also there's a lot of steep sections on here and over and over again we've talked about the downhill right so after the Clyde kicker you do have a lot of really steep downhills into some flat sections heading into the champion sprint and i think that champion sprint is also going to be a section they're obviously not going to be going for any points or anything through that champion sprint but i think with the downhill nature that rolling into the Clyde kicker not too far off in the distance it gives an opportunity for riders to take road through speed make the racing hard from that point and then kick into the Clyde kicker if everybody reserves it for the Clyde kicker every single lap I think the reality is Adam at that point it's kind of like everybody can kind of make it over unless their legs are totally done so I think it's the other sections of course where people are going to be thinking about how can I make this harder than just the Clyde kicker put people's heart rates through the roof so that when we actually hit that key moment of course then we know that we can make a split. Yeah, the other thing that really interests me about this race is the draft power-up. It's one of the only power-ups that does not increase your speed as a rider. It just makes it easier for you in wheels, which is really encouraging of negative racing. And I think that could just play into the hands of a breakaway, even though it doesn't help you in a breakaway. It might just stop the packs behind really coming for you and really bringing you back. So who knows what's going to happen here? It's going to be a fascinating race. Back to the studio. That is fascinating. I hadn't thought about it like that, Matt. The, the, yeah. the, the, the draft power-up actually might... It, there's only 10 of them. It's a very small pack anyway, but I can imagine once you're sitting in there, you want to make the most of those 40 seconds you get of draft, don't you? Oh, totally. And, and the fact is, this is the shortest race, 15.9 Ks, shortest race, but with the most opportunities to get a fresh power up. Yeah. So, but it's quite counterintuitive. There's no benefit from deploying your draft power up if you're on the front, as, as Adam alluded to. It could make for a negative race, but flip it round, it could make for an aggressive one to try and break away and then see who's going to chase. Anyway, I believe they're out of the pens. Right then. And we are underway. There we go. Fox, we almost got time for a countdown. Three, Look at that. Two, one, Go. And there we go. There's that is, that is riders. it. Ten riders. We can say goodbye to the rest of them. They were there just to give them a little bit of support on their way. Uh, there is winner of race two, Havard Glednes, or Horvard Glednes, as I heard Adam call him there. So I must get my pronunciation correct. The double A is an O, Horvard Glednes, leading the Movistar rider. That is a tiny pack. Let's see if the drafting power-ups do do that, as was suggested it could be the case. But we've gone from 170 riders this evening to just 10. And within this 10, there is our first ever Zwift Games Sprint Champion. Tonight, that Sprint Champion will take away $7,000. $7,000, Matt? It's not uh, bad for a day's work, evening's work, is it? On bike. I know. $7, and then, uh, yes, yeah, it's, 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 it's the, the kicker as well, isn't it? It's the yeah. gold, the, the overall as well, that, that yeah. uh, that's a little bit further down the line, but it's the gold kicker. Yeah. Wahoo kicker as well. Yeah. I think it's worth giving a big shout out, definitely worth giving a big shout out to our sponsors, Wahoo, Adidas as well, yeah. and of course Oakley, um, who uh, are, are debuting yep. um, at brand new products. Yes, they are. They're debuting their Svera glasses. Um, and actually, if you're taking part in the community races, that provides an opportunity to get an unlock for the Svera glasses in your avatar within the Zwift game as well. So it's a great opportunity to do that, as well as picking up an unlock for everyone who takes part in the Tempo 3 Stripes Boa shoes as well, which are very smart indeed. I'm going to try and bag myself a pair of them this week on the platform. Indeed. Well, that's... Uh... A little bit of a move off the front there by Michael Kaminsky. Already got a few power-ups. Remember, the power-up jersey has been decided already. We'll give you that at the end of the show, but please still get involved. Uh, these final 10 riders here uh, <coughs> on their first lap of this uh, Glasgow circuit. Up and down. 
Clyde kicker coming up very shortly. It's only short. You can see the top. That's the horrible thing about the Clyde kicker. You can actually see it. There's a small climb before it flattens, drops down, then kicks up again. And as we round this corner, we'll be on it. These laps will come round thick and fast. Um, will we see a negative race? Will we see an aggressive race? Again, if I... The thing is, all of the riders in this little group here, the final 10, have all obviously got a pretty handy sprint. Yep. But also, their punches do. Here's the climb. We're not quite on it yet. It flattens here, and that's where it kicks up. James Barnes of South Africa on the front, 509 watts. It looks like he's really knee leaning into this one, trying to split things early. It's only short, but it's very steep as well. Tepo Lario's gone after him to try and close it down. I think we're going to see it come to back together over the top. This is the first time up the Clyde Kicker. A lot of them have used their draft power-ups already, maybe wisely, Matt, while they're all still together, because this could be splitting up. Let's have a look. Let's count the numbers and see if we're all in there together. Dra uh, drafting power-ups being used now on the descent. That makes sense, so you get an increased recovery. Let's remember, 40 seconds they last for while they're being deployed. Yeah, it's a pretty long one as well. It does give you an opportunity uh, to rest up. But if you, again, you would imagine the logical place to use it is when, if you look at the amount of power, the, uh, how high the heart rates went up the Clyde Kicker, immediately you'd automatically want to deploy it over the top to give yourself a little bit of a break. But you could also, conversely, use it just a little bit later. And after you've had a recovery, go for a surprise attack. There's various ways to use this one as we are heading in towards uh, this uh, next right-hander. There's Scotty the Squirrel yep. floating, surveying the scene. 13.1 k's to go. I tell you what, should we bring in our resident mm, experts? Should we bring in Adam and Nathan just to see what their thoughts are on the way, the way things have gone so far? And also, whether... Actually, Adam, you, you talked about the use of the, the power-up to be negative. Do you think you could flip it round? Do you think there's a way you could use it to your benefit to, to launch off the back of it? Because it, it, is, it is an unusual power-up, but I think if you really think about it, you can be quite disruptive with it. Yeah, one of my favourite ways to use draft is to do a really big dig as an attack and then stop and kind of wait for other people to kind of come over the top. Then you use the power up when you're in the draft again and the race is hard. So you're kind of instigating a hard attack and then really allowing other people to do the work for you. You profit off it and then you go again over the top. I think that's definitely a possible way to use this power up on this course. But uh, it's, it's hard because it does rely on certain people doing certain things and you need to be able to read other people as well as you can read the game really and there's certain riders in here like Holden Comia who probably aren't going to do anything they're not going to chase anything his win condition is I wait for this sprint and if it comes to a sprint I am going to smash it and so you've got to be aware of who these riders are what they're going to do and how they're likely going to play it what we're seeing from Teppo I guess he's he's already going off the front he's trying to make moves so you know he's he's waiting for those opportunities and he wants that opportunistic win hopefully um oh, I don't know there's so many options that could happen in this what do you think Nathan yeah, what I'm seeing is maybe a little bit of one-two punching going from Thrall and Barnes. You are, you know, we do have the two next riders that are making moves. You will see that Thomas Thrall, recently crowned Canadian national champion, now covering moves toward the front. Capolorio and uh, Varney, both also kind of your uh, resident streamers, I would say, in some ways. They kind of are these community... Um, personalities and the fact that the two of them are making moves off the front is kind of fun and uh you know they are taking this super seriously obviously at the same time but i wouldn't be surprised if they're kind of watching each other and be like yeah i know what you're up to let's go ahead and try and make this happen but we do have a two second gap off the front here and you know adam i think that uh with how hard the racing is you can have all the plans in the world at a certain point they might just not work out because the racing has been so hard yeah, this is super dangerous as well. I mean, they know they're kind of securing a potential one and two, and that might be good enough for them. You know, obviously, they can deal with the scenario of trying to win the race when it gets to the finish line. But if you can gain 10 seconds, and that's what they're doing right now, go for it. Work with someone. Get the teamwork working with someone that you've never really worked with before. You know, they can form that alliance. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. Seven seconds, or oh, it's going to be really dangerous, this move. Um, and... I don't see why they wouldn't work together. It works for both of them. They're both winning here. So, yeah, it's going to be super interesting if they really chase this and how hard they have to push the Clyde kicker behind now. Yeah, and I think uh, at this point we're going to see a lot of effort to try and bring this back on the Clyde kicker. That's what people are trusting in at this point to bring that back with James Barnes trying to chase that down. Let's get back down into the studio with Jez and Matt to call this action. 
Thank you, chaps. So that's over the Clyde kicker for the second time. It's uh, Harvey Glednes, winner of race two, not holding back this time. I thought he'd hidden a bit in race two as we went through the uh, Jurassic part of the course. Not hiding now, though, right out front. And he's been joined by Vart, Bart van den Ickout. Those two are eking out, dare I say it, a decent lead already. But there's a reaction coming from behind, too. We can't afford to hesitate on a course like this with so few riders. If you wait and if you hesitate, they can just open up a lead very, very quickly. So Kaminski, the Polish champion, is committed and he's actually getting across this gap pretty fast. 7.5 watts a kilo. Um, gap is coming down to 3.2 seconds. A good move, but not too far behind is Josh Harris, Tom Thrall, James Barnes as well. Not quite in his slipstream, although coming straight over the top is Harris now with Kaminski. Um, they just, they, those two rods were too, too dangerous to let go. And also remember, we're, we're talking about the prestige, the points for the overall. But as you said at the top, $7,000 for yeah. the win, $5,000 for second, $3,000 for third tonight. You don't want to just see that guy up in smoke. No. You can't play it too tactically no. at all, especially if you've got good legs. As you'll know from racing, Jez, the worst thing you want in a tactical situation is to know that you've got good legs but are holding back tactically. Yeah. You've just got to commit and chase it down. And that's what we saw the Polish champion Kaminski do. Yeah. Didn't hesitate and shut the gap down. They've still got a two and a half second lead, but um, yeah, they're working well together at the moment. Um, it was by no means a foregone conclusion that we'd see both of the winners of the first two races in this one. Of course, the winner of race two would be in race three, but let's remind ourselves, Vidar Mel, the winner of the opening sprint race of the night is here. Harvard, Harvard Glidnes is also here as we come towards the finish line again for the second time now, or together, third yeah. time because we rolled through at the beginning, didn't we? We wondered before this race started, Matt, whether it might just be smashed to pieces. It could have ended up looking like a cyclocross race or a time trial all spread out. But this, we've de definite bunching up happening there behind. Yeah. But, but at the moment, they're racing for third place. I think what we've, what we've seen as well, we've raced on this circuit before. When you look at the, the world champion, Johannesson, who isn't here, he went away with about, I think it was three or four laps to yep. go. And, and what they're not going to let happen, and it was a similar elimination process with 10, I think it was 10 finalists. Um, they don't want to let that happen again. Once a rider gets sort of 10 seconds on a circuit like this, especially a strong rider, because let, let, let's be honest with you, um, everybody in this final, they're not just tactically astute, they're also fast, and you've got to have good legs, because we've got the cream of the crop here. We've got the, probably the best ever field assembled here for the Zwift Games, the best Zwift riders out there. So to just be in the final, you've got good legs. So everybody needs to be given that little bit of respect. Yeah. And also they'll be learning from the past and how this circuit is ridden. So uh, that prior knowledge, I think, has, has meant that the two riders out, out in front have had that lead extinguished because it, it was just too much mm. of a chance. They just couldn't let them go. So it's all back together. Yep. And we've got Vido Mel, two teammates, of course, from Movistar, Vido Mel and Hava Gledn is now leading this group. Yeah, they've just exited the Kelvin Grove Park part of the course over on the western edge of Glasgow in real life. And they could see Arthur's seat just beyond them as well, which, of course, is in a different part of Scotland. But I just love in Zwift, we can oh, just draw not? all these things together. Want? It's like it is. It's, it's purifying the very best parts of central Scotland. Absolutely lovely. Well, let's, should we bring in the race dashboard again? Yes, let's have a look at it. Don't forget, you can follow exactly the same data that Matt and I are seeing here in the studio together uh, just by following that link. It's in the link as well underneath what you're watching. It's in our uh, notes on the YouTube channel as well. So just click on it and it'll be able to take you across to, uh, to see all that data. Yeah, and you can click on the riders that you want to uh, analyse. You can also see them picture in picture as you can see. Uh, Tipo Loro in the centre, still looking pretty calm as we head up the Clyde kicker again. Let's take them to the top before we throw back to, uh, to Adam and Nathan again, just to see what happens on here. Johannes Keiding, a rider we don't know too much about. He's one of the least known riders, for me anyway, in this group. A couple of riders already before the top of the climb, well they haven't obviously deployed it yet, just dropping that draft power up. They'll get another one as they roll through. Still all together, still a few more ride-ons here. A little bit cagey that yeah, time up, Jess. Definitely. It's, I guess we mentioned the fact that that, uh, that draft power-up lasts 40 seconds. It's so long that we're seeing riders dropping it before they get to the top of the hill because they know they need to make the most of it all the way down the downhill and into this next rise again. It's never really flat until you get towards the finish line, is it? It's, this part of the course is, uh, is up and down all the time. Exactly, and to get the benefit of it, you don't want to be on the front either because you lose the benefit. You have to be uh, tucked behind. So all the riders using it, and these are experienced Swifters, as we know, making sure they're backing off to get maximum mm. benefit and then 
then going back over the top. I want to pick Nathan's brains and Adam's about that little attack and why it was neutralised so quick. Let's bring the guys in again with 7.1k to go. In the shadow of Scotty the Squirrel, Adam, what did you think? That initially looked like a really dangerous breakaway. Do you think these riders have learned from what happened in the World Championships, the kind of nuances of this circuit? That was a dangerous move to let go. Yeah, definitely. I think even more so the one rider in here who I would probably say is one of the savviest of the Zwifters, Michael Kaminsky. He was the one who really decided, no, that's too much. It needs to come back and it needs to come back now. And not just most of the way, it needs to come back all of the way. And that's what they did with Bjorn in the World Champs last year. They brought it back to about two seconds, but because they all just didn't, they, they didn't bring it all the way back. Before you know it, it expanded to 15 and then it was kind of race done. Kaminsky knew, he knew it had to come back there and then, otherwise he was seeing the podium places going up the road. And uh, yeah, really, really smart by him. Uh, it was a big effort. It'll be interesting to see how much he has left, but uh, he's now in the mix for the win still. Whereas if he didn't do it, that was that was race done almost so yeah really smart from him um but yeah we're just seeing a peppering up front now and uh oh it's going to be a tense final couple of laps uh, i don't really know who would want to go long here but i think there's going to be someone yeah i think adam they have to break this apart in my opinion i mean unless the last lap is just absolutely insane we've got two to go now at this point and if the last lap is nonstop attacks, they may be able to make a rider like Jaldines and Camus. And here's the thing. Being a pure sprinter may not be that much of an advantage until you get here. Holden has sat and sat and sat and waited and waited. He has not been a part of any moves whatsoever. Just cover and kill, cover and kill. Out of everyone who's going to be the freshest, it's Holden. And I coming into this race, there's no way I would have been like, yeah, Holden's going to be there after how much of attrition... This is a whole new rider, and we actually saw it in National Island Racing League a couple of weeks back on one of the final races. We were in the jungle circuit, it's got a good climb on it, and he ended up making it to the final and sprinting through like a maniac with that, I think, 1,800 watts or something that this guy has. If they come to the champion sprint on a downhill, having the weight that he has and the power he has, Adam, how do you go past Holden if he makes it there? You don't. You, you don't beat him in a sprint if he really wants to win this and he's still there at the finish. It's going to be super tough. And it's so interesting that you say about how much energy he's conserved. I looked at the watts per kilo after race one and most guys in there had done 5.2. Vida Mel was about 4.9. Everyone was ballpark around there. He did 4.1. He did so much less work than everyone in that race. He put the chips down where it mattered. He got over that climb and he was there in the finish. And then he just unleashed his kick and that was all he needed to do. He's so, so smart. He's so, so savvy. And I think uh, the words we got earlier were patient and vicious. That is definitely Mr. Patience and Mr. Vicious that we're seeing right now. 100%. Well, we've got a lap and a half to go. Hitting the Clyde kicker. Let's get back to the studio for the final calls. So we're almost, thank you, gentlemen. We're almost back to the top of the Clyde kicker for the penultimate time. And already power-ups being thrown down just to hang on to this. Still together. We've already had our cards marked for the only American in this field now, too, who's there. Because he can knock out. Holden Komio can knock out. 1,800 watts in his final sprint. And he has survived very well. Just as uh, our two colleagues there have said Matt so we've marked the cards of the American definitely 1800 will do very nicely in that it running it <laughs> certainly would I wouldn't even be able to get half of that power <laughs> these days but uh, no it is I tell you what as we head into this final lap very very shortly uh, we're coming into the the last part of lap four before we have that final three and a bit case to go everybody's still all together you talked about it at the top of the show it's how international the Zwift games really is the best run so look at the flags we've got two from Norway we've got Finland we've got Canada we've got Belgium we've got South Africa we've got the United States of America, we've got Poland, we've got Australia. It's absolutely, it's wonderful. It really, yeah. really is. The, the, the cream of the crop, but spread all over the globe. Absolutely yeah. magnificent. And that's not through who you know. That's not through, you know, selection of national things or anything like that. It is pure, through pure ability. They had to qualify to get into these, these uh, Zwift games anyway. And that's why we've got it how it is. It's a very fair arena, isn't it? Look at this, Kaminsky now. I was thinking that somebody has to roll the dice and go down with 
with their hair on fire because not all of them can leave it to a sprint and bet on 1800 watts and the first of those to do so before we go into this final lap is Kaminsky. Well, Adam called it, didn't he? A very intelligent rider indeed. He was the one that shut that gap down about a lap ago, but he's been caught straight away. They were not letting him go clear. A couple more power-ups being deployed, given that amount, has given them that extra recovery, should I say, as we're heading towards the finish. There is the finish line. They will get the virtual belt. Um, Scotty looking down. It's, uh, I tell you what, when you look at the way this is rendered, they've rendered Glasgow absolutely beautifully. It really, really is wonderful. Josh Harris now moving through to the front, trying to eke out a little bit of a lead. One lap to go. This is the Sprint Championships, the opening weekend of the Swift Games. Ten riders in the final, nine nations represented. Who is going to go away with the $7,000 prize and the concept bike as well? Absolutely, that beautiful gold concept Z1 bike. Z1 bike, I should call Z1. it in Swift language, really, shouldn't I? But... Uh, big points are going to be scored by all 10 of these going through. They've done very, very well in terms of the Wahoo overall in these Zwift games. But this is all about being the Zwift Sprint Champion. We're going into what could be a two-hour race next weekend in the Epic Championships. Totally different to this. This is all about these final 2.5 kilometres. And still, despite the fact that Vidar Mel having won the opening race is on the front, it's still so close together, Matt. Yeah, look at this though, out of the saddle, that picture in picture, back down in the saddle again, he's opened up a little bit of a lead, Josh Harris fighting to get into that slipstream of Vido Mel, and a couple of metres back is Thomas Thrall, a fellow countryman, also from Movistar, he, you wouldn't imagine he'd do any direct chasing, of course he'd love to win this, but what he won't do is bring back his teammate and his fellow countrymen, so they've got that as a little bit of an advantage, they're back together again, the Clyde kicker, they're going to see another great shot there, when they turn right they will see the final ascent of the Clive kicker two k's to go as we continue to focus on Vidar Mel who will do an attack early James Barnes of South Africa now moves through to the front as we know once they're over the top of the Clive kicker it's just a few linked corners and then the flat fast run into the finish at the uh, the final sprint the final sprint of this whole evening of racing this the third and final sprint race in these sprint championships in the Zwift games and Vidar Mel is going again this is remarkable from the winner of our opening race this evening well over what an hour and a half ago now Matt and he's got the energy to raise it he doesn't want to wait for the sprint but the problem is he is being just emerged there's riders coming around him as well the mobby star man is going to try and hang on yeah Vidar Mel has been swept by its Bart Van Ickhout the rider he went away with a couple of laps ago Tipper Laurier also there Vidar Mel James Barnes nothing between these riders until half a second all 10 riders in the final are still there Michael Kaminsky the Polish champion laying back does that suggest yep. something if riders lay back they build up that momentum and not many riders here have you noticed nobody has deployed um, or they might have done it earlier, nobody's deployed just yet that draft power up. Perhaps they're saving it to do something a little bit unorthodox as we head deep into this final lap. 1,300 metres to go, all 10 riders glued together here. James Barnes and Mikhail Kaminsky just off the back there, maybe saving a little something, just rejoining the group. We still have 10 riders together. It is going to come down to this final sprint. Watching Kaminsky, the Polish champion, drop it's right back. I wonder off. whether he's waiting for some kind of layback because look at the, the watts per kilo. I don't think he's getting dropped, Matt. I think he's waiting to try something, yeah. a surge through that group maybe. Yeah, he's one of the smartest riders. Look at that. He's using he's using his power up now so he's going to get that a benefit of the draft. He's holding it there and he then goes, he's going to use the momentum. There we go. He's, he's using. <laughs> he won't get the benefit benefit of the draft now, but he used it, they're saving energy, 850 metres to go, Jess, Kaminsky, wow. the Polish champion, 10 watts a kilo, 758 watts, he is flying, this is an attempt to try and win this one, it's the gold concept Z1 bike, it's $7,000, he's clear. Kaminsky, what a ride, we saw it, didn't we, he almost telegraphed it to us, but I don't think the others would have noticed, he dropped right back, used his power up, absolutely perfect Zwifting, that is gamification in process, in game, in the race, and he now leads, what's he got, nearly four seconds, is there any hesitation, they can't hesitate now, surely, there's 328, 300 metres to go, Kaminsky's riding away with this, but here they come, they are going to be chasing him down all the way to the finish line, this is it, you can see the finish line, Kaminsky is looking like he's going to be our sprint champion, the pole look for them coming into the shot beneath is he gonna make it yes he is he's gonna be our opening champion on the opening night <laughs> and it's so close Matt. Oh, so oh, close oh. Oh. what a, do you know what adam hit the nail on the head earlier on <laughs> didn't he um he said he was the smartest rider out there 
that it, I mean, we saw it happening in real time. That was one of the best uses of a power-up. A power-up that is a little bit maligned. It yep. can be used negatively, yep. Yep. but he used it so smart, and then he had the power to back it up. Let, so he, a combination, he laid off. As soon as he got back it to build up the momentum, got the benefit of the draft, and catapulted himself out the other side. Do you know what? That was a beautiful, beautiful win. 7,000 bucks mm -hmm. in the bag. No wonder he put both yeah. arms up. What a spectacular evening of racing, and what a way to cap it off. Chapeau, Michael Kaminsky, the Polish champion. Yeah. That was brilliant. There he is. <laughs> what a ride. And he's going to be wearing, Matt, let's not forget that gold jersey in next week's racing for the men, of course, as well. Polish rider, Michal Kaminsky, <laughs> using what could have only been 10 seconds of the 40 seconds that power-up gave him, if that, but it's just enough, as you say, to get that perfect surge going through. Makes and if you're yeah. new to watching Zwift Racing here on our Zwift YouTube channel, what you've just seen is a classic example of, of how you learn the craft of racing it, just as you would IRL on the road in real life, but, but Zwifting itself has its own tactics and its That's own it's about. Yeah. measured riding, doesn't it? It is. It's, you've got to have good legs. You've got to be super fit. These are some of the fittest athletes uh, in the world, but also, as you said, there's the craft. Yeah. There's the thing that you take. It takes a while to learn. It's the deployment of power-ups. It's understanding the circuits. It's the nuanced often style of pedaling and understanding how you generate power. It's its own sport, and this is why we have, this is the Zwift Games, this is what it's all about, and there is the final top 10. Wow, a very deserving ride. Michal Kaminski, the Polish rider, the Polish national champion, measuring his ride absolutely brilliantly to finish ahead of uh, race one winner, Vidar Mel, and then Teppo Lario, the Finn in third. So a Pole, a Norwegian, a Finn, a South African in James Barnes in fourth place there. Excellent points for him. In fact, great points for all of these top yeah, 10 riders totally. going into it. Just to get into this final is a, is a big achievement in 170 of the world's best riders on Zwift as well. Do you want to pick it up from fifth? Yeah, so sixth place, Bart van Eckhout, the early attacker there for Belgium. The first of the only American in the top 10, of course, only one of the final Holden Collier. Didn't quite manage to unleash the sprint he wanted in seventh. Thomas Rawl, the Canadian champion, eighth. Harvey Glenius, Glednes, teammate of the silver medalist Fidel Mel there in ninth, and then rounding out our top 10 from Sweden at 1.4 seconds behind at Johannes Kiding. There's your top 10. And all of those rods, of course, will be scoring a nice amount of points for the overall. Absolutely. <laughs> I think everyone at home knows how much we enjoyed that. That was great. Really it, I've enjoyed, do you know what? Every, every single race, as you'd expect, have a different identity. With the jeopardy there, we saw some riders get it wrong. A lot will be, there'll be a lot of change tactics for next week. Yeah, Completely yeah. different kettle of fish. We can mm. focus on that later. But what we've had tonight is some of the best Zwift, uh, Zwift racing I've ever seen. A brilliant format, some of the best riders in the world. And I hope that everybody at home has been, has been thrilled and excited by that and inspired by it yeah, as yeah. well. I hope you get out and ride on Zwift, whether it's um, on, the, in the, on the Zwift Games courses or just going out for a baz on Zwift, because yeah. it's great fun. Yeah. I've been royally entertained. It's been great, hasn't it? it has. Should we find out what, what Nathan and Adam think? Uh, all right, well? I would imagine it would be ditto. I'm, I'm sure they were absolutely loving it. <laughs> <laughs> Boys, what did we think? What did we think? Because that was a, an amazing... The fact that they all were together going into that last sprint as well. Yeah, racers make the race, that's for sure. And everybody played their cards. Nobody was wanting to leave it the chance as far as the abilities they had out there. I think, Adam, when we came into this race, we were naming riders and what their talents were. And I think everybody threw their talents out on course for sure, used them to their full. Yeah, I'm over the moon to see that result, honestly. That was one of the best moves I've probably ever seen in Zwift Racing. Really, really incredible Zwift Craft. And he just caught them all off guard. Like, he's probably not the best sprinter in there, but he is so, so savvy with what he does, Michael Kaminsky. And uh, really, really pleased to see him get that win because to animate the race in that way, to control it, I mean, he, he basically played the field. He made them all you know, bring, bring back the group for him. And he oh, he just pulled off an incredible move. I'm going to christen him the uh, the king of the downhills because he's done moves like that before on downhills and he, he uses momentum so well. Fascinating to watch. Really, really enjoy seeing him do it. Um, but yeah, again, Holden Komia as well. He was the fastest in the sprint. Um, he was coming through so hot and maybe just left it a little late or maybe that final minute was just too hard. I think everyone was probably right on their limit. 
I think you're right there. I really do think that it was just too difficult. That from and I was wondering about that coming into that uh, final flat before the little bump up to the, the champion sprint. That uh, to go from that far out and you saw Harvard Geldings ramp up to 13 watts per kilogram going, it's now or never. And I was wondering if they were just going to race for second. I really was like, who's willing to even give it a go to even come close to bringing it back? And it was it was Harvey Teldings that was able to do so. But that actually made him go all the way back to ninth place by the end of it. And look at where Vidar Mail ends up. Vidar Mail, this guy on the day... I mean, do we, it, it, I know there isn't any kind of official award or anything on this, but I mean, with what we saw him do in race number one, then making it through to race number two or to race, to race number three. I mean, this guy put out so much energy on the day and it takes second place overall. And then there's the tactical ride from Teppo Lorio. I don't want to take anything away from his fitness level, but I'd love to hear from Teppo at some point. I mean, what was that third place Teppo Lorio? I mean, who would have picked that? That's like amazing to see that from him. Absolutely crazy on that third place finish. And it goes to show if you play your cards right, man, you can get a quite amazing result, can't you, Adam, out on Zwift? Yeah, there's a reason why Teppo's level 100, I guess. <laughs> that's where the uh, that's where the experience comes in play. So, yeah, he's he's really, really on it with his Zwift craft and fantastic result for him. It's going to be curious to see how many people in the community this week are maybe trying that move from Kaminsky. Um, because, yeah, going from the back there, you, you said it for Horvard Jones. There was no choice for everyone. They knew if they chased that, they lose the race. They ruin their own race because the way Kaminsky did it, there was no way for anyone to get on his wheel. There was no way. You had to commit 100%, just like he did, and have had the momentum from the back. Because he had that momentum from the back, the layoff into the pack, there was nothing you could do. It was an incredible move. And there was just nothing you could do to stop that. And then the pack dynamics behind play, you know, no one wants to chase that. You've got just too much road to really be able to launch a sprint there. There's nothing you can do. Incredible move. Really, really pleased for him. Um, yeah, and a lot of people that we maybe expected as the best sprinters there missed out. James Barnes, fourth. Very, very good sprinter. Always really good in the finish. Super tight on the line. I mean, I think between second place and tenth place, I think there was maybe 0.1 of a second. So you can see it here. Yeah, it's just about getting it right on the day and yeah michael kaminsky definitely got it right on the day yeah on that point on the black dynamics i think it was so well i think it was just so drawn out really really such a drawn out sprint that you couldn't come around you couldn't come around you had to have a massive amount of power and speed over the top of the other riders in order to do so and as you said with holden he was set up right for a, a pure sprint 300 400 meters to the line or so 200 whatever it might be but that positioning, if you're not positioned well, when it completely opens up and it's that long of a drawn out sprint, it's just not going to do it for you. We said it was a 200 meter to the line more situation for him. Didn't end up happening because of the way Kaminsky made that happen. He really controlled the race. Well, let's head back over to Stu for the overall for the championship. We'll get, we're we're going to get a look at that. Thank you, Nathan. Right now. It's all been about feeding into the overall championship. I think we've got probably yep. quite a good idea who is uh, yeah. right up there anyway from those final 10 who was up there. Let's have a look at the championship standings as they stand at the end of the sprint championship. Mikhail Kaminsky, let's remember this is impacted by three races this evening. So Mikhail Kaminsky, the winner of our final race, uh, carries into next weekend's epic championship 100 points. 99 points to Vidar Mail, the winner of uh, the opening race this evening. And then Tepolario in third. Uh, James Barnes, Josh Harris in fifth. Indeed, then we have Bart Van Eckout, Holden Comier, Tom Thrall, Harvard Glenners, and Johannes Randrop Kiding to give him his full name. So uh, that is your top 10. No real surprise there. It's going to get a little bit. I like the fact that there's not a lot between the, the gaps. Here's the, here's the rest uh, Paradine, Zach Nair, Freddie Ovet. One yeah. of the, the top favourites. Yeah. So, Lord of Yes, I'm still there. Yeah. So I'm happy with that. Yeah. That'll do yes, me going into your next boy. week. There's your boy. Uh, who have we got next? You and Mackie right there, the Scotsman as well, rolling down now to the top 30. Uh, Brian Duffy there, who we interviewed at the beginning. Bjorn Anderson, Muir, who rode well in that second race tonight as well. Your tip there, Plantreau. Yes, Plantreau needs to move up a little bit, but I, as I say, I've jinxed him by picking him, Matt. That's the problem. 
you know, there's some, uh, again, with the way that the points are, are stacked, there's still a lot of opportunities, especially given the completely different profile we've got mm. to next week's way, the race. Um, there's still a lot of opportunities for riders to move back up as we head back through yep. uh, the top 100, because only the top 100 score points. Well, lots of you will be watching following riders who might well be family members, loved ones, friends, club mates maybe who are racing in this massive pack of 170 riders who started tonight. Don't forget, it's only the top 100 who actually score the points though, but you'll be watching, I suspect, lots of you looking out for your chosen riders. Perhaps you're looking for riders that you've uh, smashed a few power-ups to. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for your involvement, everyone at home tonight. It's been really nice to know that the community is so heavily involved in what we're doing. Yeah, there'll, be, there'll be people watching, Matt, who've been Zwifting and have been a member of the Zwifting community since the very beginning. But there'll be some others as well who are quite new to it. For some of them watching, this might well be their first time actually watching live Zwift racing as well. So if that's you, um, I hope you've enjoyed it. We've yeah. definitely enjoyed it. And let us know what you think. We've said it a few times, but I'm going to say it again yeah. as we head towards the end of the show. Get involved in the comments. It really does mean a lot to us uh, to let us know how you feel, what you feel about, about the Zwift game so far. Lots more to come, of course, starting tomorrow, because the women have got to do it all again. Yep. Well, not again, yep. for the first time. Absolutely. Exactly in the same we format. Um, so I'm excited about that. So it's going to keep us busy. It certainly will. Same presenters tomorrow. Same uh, analysts. Same courses. Same prizes, same prize money, same, same rules, just a different pack of riders. Yes. And there's some brilliant riders in there as well tomorrow who will be really taking this one on as well. So we're very much looking forward to that. Make sure you join us for that. It's exactly the same time tomorrow. Don't worry, we're not done just yet because we're just waiting to see how badly we did at predicting things so far. Yeah. We should be able to bring up um, our predictor results. I don't results. know. I don't think it went too well. Um, no. I, but, but there we go. But I'll tell you one thing I, I did notice um, on uh, Kaminsky's bike. When riders hit the power-up button, you mm -hmm. can actually get a friend to do it. And that's perfectly within the yep. rules. Uh, it can be uh, a, a special button or, or just a space bar on your computer. Um, but he actually had Zwift Play, so he's totally geared up. I mean, a, a cracking bike rider, but it completely immersed in the game side yep. of Zwifting, yep. which at this level you need to be, but that yep. was good to see. Yep. I think we've got the results. The predictable oh, results can we just, are Can in. we not just ignore them? Oh, oh no. <laughs> All right, so Jez. Ah. Uh, Okay. No, no position. No. Uh, Nathan, no. No. Um, uh, Nathan Guerra, Brian Duffy, 79th. So you, you actually weren't too bad. Yeah. 67th. Mouldy, um, oh yeah, 40th. Um, Danny's prediction, Ollie Jones. Doesn't, well, it, mm. not, he's not scored there. No, uh, 87 points for Lionel Villasan. That's not too bad. I think I might be the best. Yeah, so you far. are. You I'm are. happy with that. You've picked a proper ringer. So I'm, uh, yeah, so, so actually, so it's me first, Hannah in third, Nathan second. And then I don't, it doesn't, I don't know where you actually are in there, mm. but I would imagine you might actually be fourth. Yeah. yeah. So hey, that's not too bad. Just I'll off the that. podium. Yeah, but Mikel Plantro has the nicest jersey of all those. Oh, well, apart from the World Champions jersey, but we know that. We know that. This is something we're going to be coming back to all the way through the next three I'm weeks. In the lead. We're doing it for the women too friends. as well. We've taken, we've picked our favourites for the for the women's race too as well, which you'll see tomorrow. So we'll see how badly wrong we can get that. I have to admit, I've picked the ringer of all ringers tomorrow, and you're going to have to join us tomorrow to find out who that is. But I, I, my pick tomorrow. I'm not going to say it now, but my pick for tomorrow, I can't fail. Even with it. my record, I can't fail. But. I certainly give it a good go. Uh, right, uh, looking at the the ride on table, I think the um, oh, we're going to come back to the ride on table. Sorry, um, yes, sorry, we'll, <laughs> we will look at the ride on table. I think should we have a look at the ride on table? Yes, See please. how people did from all your. Um, it's oh, do you know we'll wait for that. We'll wait for that. Um, we know that next week is going to be quite different yes. because there's only one race. And as we said, uh, Matt, certainly with the men, we're probably looking at around about two hours of racing yeah. uh, next week it's on the epic new route, another new route as well. Yeah, I've got the details. It, it is. It's, it's one of the longest races we've had on Zwift. But there are longer races, community races, but nothing quite this long. Uh, it is 81K. It's going to be 878 metres of elevation. Um, Lots of familiar parts. There's, there's also a couple of, th uh, we, we go through Titans Grove twice. Yep. Okay, $1,000 preem. So in addition to the $7,000 uh, on offer for the winner of the men's and the women's, there's two lots of $1,000 preems as well. So the stakes are even yep. higher, but this one's gonna be completely different. Yeah, I think it's going to be, even if you assume 40, 40 uh, Ks an hour, maybe two hours of racing. 
or just over. So a completely different proposition. So fueling, yeah. tactics are going to play into it. And also, I think the um, those preems are going to make things very aggressive. I think they'll be very active. I think my riders might even focus on going, because that's worth it, isn't it? Yep. You might have uh, riders with an overall focus, riders with a focus on the preems, and that creates disruption. So I believe the ride-on right. jersey is ready right. to look at. Here we go. Let's see. Oh, oh now I wasn't expecting that's a surprise. That. Danish rider Simon Nielsen taking the most ride on. So a lot of fans there for the Danish rider, just ahead of Teppo Lario. We, we kind of teased the Teppo Lario yeah. one. So Simon Nielsen is going to be riding that lovely light blue ride on jersey. I like there that. There it is. Smart, Ooh. isn't it? I'd, I'd, I'd wear that out on the road as well. Yeah, looks very nice. Very Ooh, that's nice, nice indeed. That's the ride on jersey. A big thumbs up. Um, fantastic. No, thank you very much to all of you who opened up your companion apps and got involved. Yep. It's massively important and make sure you do the same tomorrow for the women's race yep. as well. And we'll give you some more deals ahead. But uh, what, what an evening that was, absolutely fantastic. And that ride on Jersey will be like a whole warm hug of love from the community, you know what I mean? It's, oh, it it's is, literally like, woven, it's, yeah. like woven a, with love. Like the, hug, like, like the hug Jersey. Yeah. Now, don't forget the Zwift Games Community Series is going on right now and throughout the month of March. So if you've been inspired by what you've seen, you can, yes you, yes you, can go and take on the very same races you've seen our athletes tackle today with some huge community race field, big ones. Yeah, and how you can do that is right now until the end of Monday, you can race the Loop the Loop, which we saw as race number one. Next week, it's the Jurassic Coast, which today was race number two. And the week after, it was just what we've just seen, the Glasgow Crit Circuit. So hopefully you've picked up some tips and tricks. So go and jump on and give it a try. It's some of the best fun you can ever have on a bike. Take it from me, because I do it a lot and I love it. Yep, I'm gonna be doing it these next few weeks, definitely. So look out for us. If you see us, give us a ride on as well. I might need it. I think I'll probably need it. <laughs> If you miss any of those stages, by the way, you're going to have a chance to make up any you've missed in the last two weeks of March too. Well, that leads us to just say thank you very much indeed for watching. It's been a pleasure to have your company. Thanks for getting involved in the ride-ons and in the comments. Just make sure you join us at the same time tomorrow for the women's race. But for now, from Glasgow, me and Jez are going to go for a lie down and maybe a cheeky beverage. Yes. Ride on. <laughs> See you soon. See ya.